Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the seventh teach-in at the University of Oklahoma. I'm David Robel, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the interim president of the University of Oklahoma, Joseph Harris, Jr. Uh, interim President Harris has served at the university for nearly 25 years in a variety of roles, including vice president for executive affairs, general counsel, and dean of the College of Law. In May 2019, the OU Board of Regents named him interim president. Please join me in welcoming OU Interim President Joe Harris, Jr. All right, we're off to a fast start. Um, happy Daylight Savings Time Day. That's right. We're the ones that set our alarm clocks to the right number. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, thanks to Dean Rebell uh, for all that he does and certainly for having this. Uh, we're thrilled to have with us, uh, actually to have this day, to have uh, this day after a two-year break in having the teach-in. Uh, by a show of hands, how many have made past teach-ins? Oh, fantastic. Right. We just bring them back, don't we? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Would you be with me all day long? It would help me out to have you around all day long, being supportive. Uh, that'd be terrific. Um, I, I do want to thank, uh, for those of you all who have not met them, I want to thank uh, Rod and Nancy Sanders. They have the Horizon Foundation. Uh, they live in Plano, Texas. And since the inception of this in 2012, uh, they have been the benefactors who have made this possible. And they weren't able to be here today, um, but what they do has an impact on all of us. Certainly, we're all here for that reason. So. Even in their absence, let's give them a round of applause, please. Uh, so you all know this. Over the years, we've attracted some of the leading scholars, practitioners, commentators to discuss uh, the social and political events that have shaped and are shaping uh, the American heritage. Topics in the past have included our nation's founding, the Great Depression, the Civil War, the Western Frontier, uh, and so many more. These are hosted by a really unique entity that we all know, which is the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage. Uh, the impact it's had uh, is stunning, and we are grateful uh, for them and what they've done. Uh, oftentimes at these events, it makes me reflect about the excitement of being at, uh, you know, it, it, the fact of being at a university. And I heard a quote recently um, that came from, it was a memorial for a University of Chicago professor talking about what it means to be a university. And I thought it would be a nice thing to read uh, that sets the stage for, for all that we do. And this was the quote given at this memorial. Unlike any other institution in society, the university is a bastion of intellectual pursuit, where the search for truth is unfettered, where the life of the mind is nourished, where ideas are debated and refined and deepened, and where the conversation about what is true and beautiful and good continues from generation to generation. Right? And I just love that. And I think the teaching itself uh, is a perfect example of that, right? It crosses um, generational divides, as you can see in this room, although we shouldn't have all the students separated. Um, we're glad the students are here. Uh, and I'm told there are a few more busloads coming in. Uh, but it brings people all together under this common goal, uh, under a focused topic uh, for an in-depth discussion. And, and again, one more quote, and then I will turn this over to the experts here in just a minute. Although I'm kind of enjoying this, so it might last a while. Uh, the, second, the second quote was from a student. Uh, she was a student at the time at the University of Oklahoma uh, when the last teach-in had to be canceled, uh, resulting in the two-year hiatus and this occurring, uh, that drought being ended today. Uh, but this is what she wrote in the student paper. It was published in 2017. Uh, she noted that going to the teach-in, uh, these are her words, is like Christmas. Uh, and she was sad to learn it had been put off. Uh, and she said, but this March, Christmas isn't coming. She went on to describe a personal experience she had at a previous teach-in, and she wrote this. Personally, the teach-in has vastly impacted my education at OU. Last year, by chance, I happened to sit next to an older man, roughly 85 years old, during two lectures. In between speakers, he struck, we struck up a conversation about both of our lives. He told me about how he had served as a, as a federal judge for much of his life, which was fascinating to an aspiring lawyer. He spoke about his favorite case, the best parts of being a judge, 
what it took to crack in the legal field. We discussed our shared love of our shared love for history and the Constitution. He was a lifetime conservative, and I am just the opposite. Yet we formed a bond across age divides, ideological gaps, and expertise levels. I frequently think about the words of advice he left me. Right? And what this student, what, what uh, Elena perfectly summed up, is what this event is all about. Right? It, about the personal, meaningful interactions that are taking place, uh, about passing down of wisdom, uh, not just down but across and up of wisdom that comes to us, and of course the celebration of the free exchange of ideas. Uh, this is the purpose of the teach-in. Uh, it is what we want to be as a university. Public intellectual events like this um, are not just important to a university. To me, they're at the heart of a university. Right? It's not just transmitting knowledge and information one way, uh, it, is, it is coming across. And it's also the idea that we hear from diverse points of view and that we listen to each other and think deeply. Right? That we move in a way that involves civil discourse. Right? Of all the threats to society that exist, when you look at the greatest threats to our Constitution and to democracy, and if you aren't very attentive right now, I'll give you the whole speech, and it lasts about 50 minutes. So if you're focused, you've got like 90 seconds left. Uh, otherwise, it's much longer, and I'm just close to doing it. When we really talk about what threatens our democracy, what threatens our democracy is not engaging in honest and civil discourse, about talking about what makes us different and understanding each other, not being persuaded necessarily by a different political ideology, but being able to receive it and understand it and to form those human bonds that connect us and to help us realize that our diversity in all of its ways has to be a strength for us to be successful. But it doesn't have to be a strength. It can be the wedge that drives us apart and divides us for good and destroys our democracy. And so your attendance here today and the purpose of this event itself is to show who we can be as a society. Right? It's to model to model for those that we help lead, that watch us in society, to model what it means to be together, to explore controversial topics, to unpack them, unwrap them, understand the basis for them, and then to hear both sides and then forge for ourselves not just our own belief, which hopefully is ever evolving, but just as importantly, maybe more importantly, an understanding of each other. And so it's a thrill to be here today. I'm told we're going to have a couple hundred more show up. Those are the folks that did not set their alarms and adjust them yesterday. Um, but we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, thank you for being such an important part of our university and this community. Thank you. You know, in some ways, it's been a difficult uh, year or so for the university, and, and uh, interim president Joe Harris has really helped uh, hold us together and move us forward. I think we're deeply grateful for that. So thank you, President Harris. I'd like to introduce the director of the Institute for American Constitutional Heritage, Justin Wirt. Welcome to the 2020 Teach-In. I'm Justin Word. I'm the director for the Institute of the American Constitutional Heritage here at OU, and I'm also in the Department of Political Science. At OU, we believe that providing students in our larger community with the tools to study the events that helped shape America, that helped shape America's heritage will help ensure our nation's future. And it was with that belief that we developed the Teach-In uh, many years ago in 2012. And as President Harris said, we've only had to skip it once or twice over its tenure. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about our institute, the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage. We're an interdisciplinary center here at OU. Uh, we offer a minor and a concentration in constitutional studies. We're one of the few universities in the country to offer that to undergraduates. Uh, and we are interdisciplinary. So we look at the Constitution not just from a legal perspective, 
we look at it from a political perspective, a historical perspective, and cultural perspectives. So we're really unique in that as well, and we're very lucky at OU to have a group of faculty throughout the College of Arts and Sciences, of course in the law school, in the business school, uh, that come together, offer courses um, in constitutional studies from their own departments. Uh, and we're really, really lucky uh, to have them. And if you want more information about the IACH, you can certainly see me, uh, or you can go to ou.iach.edu. Uh, but I would love to talk to anybody about it for as long uh, as they want to. Um, just a few things. Um, there will be a document, a showing of the river and the wall tonight at Sam Noble Museum at five o'clock. Uh, I'll do a little introduction of that. Uh, just to give you an idea, the New York Times recently uh, called it a passionate and spectacularly uh, photographed documentary. Uh, so it should be really interesting and I'm excited uh, about that again. That'll be five o'clock uh, in Sam Noble. And just a note on the format today, uh, our panelists will be introduced by uh, a member of the OU faculty and then they'll give a talk for about 30 minutes. So we'd like to have you hold any questions that you might have until after they're done. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A, about 20 minutes, and we'll have undergraduates walking around, uh, I hope, uh, with microphones uh, so everybody will be able to hear uh, your questions and certainly the panelists will be able uh, to answer them. And we're doing this in 50 minute blocks so we can accommodate uh, our faculty and our undergraduates um, whose class schedules match that. So what we're gonna do is take a little break now so we can start exactly at 9.30, all right? Thanks and what, enjoy the teaching.
Good morning, everybody. We're all very happy to be here. I'm Ann Hyde, and I'm a professor in the history department. And I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Catherine Benton Cohen. She's an old friend of mine. Um, we share a first job at Louisiana State University, so we share that experience. But we're also Western historians. She is a professor at Georgetown University. She got her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her BA degree from Princeton. She's an Arizona native, and she's the author of two books, both from Harvard University Press. The most recent book is called Inventing the Immigration Problem, The Dillingham Commission and Its Legacy and she'll be taught, giving us a good historical overview of this issue. She's also served as the historical advisor to the nonfiction feature film, Bisbee 17. She's had research fellowships and awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, and she and her work have appeared in a variety of media outlets, including PBS American Experience, the BBC, Descent. She also serves as the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, and her current research is about the global history of the Phelps Dodge family. So I'm delighted to welcome her to our stage here in at the University of Oklahoma. And um, well, please welcome Professor Benton Cohen. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, it's really an honor uh, to start off. Uh, well, I thought it was an honor to, to start this day, and I found out it was alphabetical. Uh, so um, thank you to my grandfather, who changed our family last name from Zabinden, which starts with a Z, to Benton, which starts with a B. Uh, OK, it, but it is an honor to be here. And I really want to thank the organizers for inviting me, especially Dean David Robel, Professor Justin Wirt, and the amazing behind the scene organizer, Helen Green, who I've invited to organize my whole life because she did such a nice job here. Um, and also to my old friend, Ann Hyde, for the introduction, and also to Coffee. OK, um, without which I could not be here this morning. Let me turn, though, to the topic at hand because it is one of vital importance. What I hope to do briefly this morning is to tell you a bit about the historical context of our current immigration situation. I hope I can give you some brief sense of the history of immigration laws and restrictions in the United States, and I'll conclude with a couple bullet points on the parallels and differences with today, as well as some of the hot button issues that have recently emerged. Although none of them are particularly new, they certainly have new permutations. So today, I want to give you a, a small sense, a brief sense of how we got from there to here, and what legacies remain in our immigration policy from what we might call its formative era, from the 1880s to 1924. I'll talk about the laws that created the first numerical or quantitative restrictions on immigration in 1917, 21, and 24. And as I mentioned, I'll gesture towards some current issues that I suspect will be the fodder for some of your questions. Uh, and I hope to leave uh, plenty of time for those questions. Now, I want to begin. I'm the first using this, so um, I'm going to hope I'm doing it right. There, I did it. OK. I want to begin um, with the story of Anna Herkner. This is Anna. Herkner uh, grew up in the bohemian, not counterculture, Czech, uh, <laughs> the Czech settlement of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Who knew? She went on to get a degree at UC Berkeley and graduated in the early 20th century, about 1904. And she graduated with a degree in Slavic literatures. After that, she got a job working at a settlement house in a Polish neighborhood in Baltimore using her Slavic language skills. And this picture is when she was employed by the Dillingham Commission, uh, which will be the subject of my talk today, um, and was the largest study of immigrants ever conducted uh, and was convened from 1907 to 1911. So Anna Herkner was the director of a study on steamship conditions, the, the conditions of steerage class passengers um, on transatlantic travels to the United States. As you can see here, along with several of her staff, she actually dressed up 
as a European peasant and took multiple transatlantic journeys in the steerage section. She chronicled harrowing journeys rife with disgusting conditions and what we would understand in the Me Too era to be rampant sexual assault and harassment, much of it by the crews of those ships. The Dillingham Commission's work, of which Herkner was a part, is, as I just mentioned, the subject of my most recent book, and I'll return to it shortly. But one reason why I wanted to open with Anna Herkner um, is that in this year, which happens to be the centennial of the 19th Amendment, right, and women's suffrage, uh, national women's suffrage, at least for white women, I have to take the time to add that Herkner went on to join the National Women's Party after her involvement in the Dillingham Commission and was among the women who was arrested for picketing Pre President Woodrow Wilson's White House in 1917. So she's a timely figure to be reminded of. All right, so to return to our topic, with regard to immigration policy, there are some pretty big differences between a century ago and today. Let me mention a few. One of the biggest is that there was basically no such thing as what some people today call illegal immigrants. Indeed, in the modern sense of the term, this category basically did not exist, except as applied to Chinese immigrants, almost all of whom had been excluded by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Besides this and a related ban on Japanese laborers in 1907, there were no <clears throat> excuse me, numerical or categorical limits on immigration before the literacy test of 1917. I'll explain a little bit about this in a second. Now, uh, let me give you an example. This is uh, Google Ngram, by the way, which is something that you can um, Google. You know, Google runs everything that Amazon doesn't run. Um, this is where you can actually type in terms and it will um, search all of the digitized books that Google has and find those terms. And, it's a lot of fun to play with, but you can see the way in which this concept and term is really a, a, a post, is a late, relatively late 20th century invention. Okay, so going back to my point about this period, here is an example of the kinds of grassroots organizing, um, uh, particularly around the Irish working class in the American West who campaigned for Chinese exclusion to give you a sense of the, the initial kinds of uh, watershed changes in immigration law um, starting in 1882, and yet they did remain limited. Relevantly, in this particular moment in 2020, as my son's school is closed because of a coronavirus case, there were a growing number of restrictions based on physical and mental health, which give us some insight into who were considered desirable immigrants. In fact, the origins of the uniformed officers of the U.S. Public Health Service was in the officers who worked at Ellis Island. And my colleague, Professor Alan Kraut, who will speak later, is an expert on this topic, so I won't say anything more about it. Nevertheless, long before there were numerical restrictions on immigrants, there were a series of laws about health, which spurred fears of an immigrant menace of disease. Um, so, for example, the first federal immigration law banned, and these are its terms, idiots and lunatics. Um, and again, if you have more questions about this, ask Professor Kraut, who's talking on something different but knows he literally wrote the book on it. So um, that's an opportunity for later. In any case, while some of these restrictions against immigrants seemed cruel or even ridiculous, in practice, they barred very few people. Something like 97 to 98% of arrivals at Ellis Island passed inspection. And this was partly because the um, boat companies examined people before embarking because they had to pay for return passage. So this was a good way of outsourcing inspection of immigrants to private companies because they wanted to make sure that the people that they brought to U.S. shores passed muster even more restrictions were coming, and those are the ones I want to talk about. So to recap, though, here are some of the big differences between then and now. There was almost no such thing as a quote-unquote illegal alien until the mid-20th century. There wasn't even a border patrol. It was not created until 1924. Now, to put this into perspective, my own grandmother was a married woman having her first child by 1924. My gr grandfather on the other side was born to an immigrant family in a border town in Arizona 
11 years before the Border Patrol was created. And I will note, I'm not that old. Their numbers, uh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped ahead here because I got very focused on the I'm not that old part. <clears throat> to reiterate, I'm not that old. Anyway, uh, the Mexicans, that Mexicans were a very small percentage of the total immigrant population in the United States in the early 20th century. Their numbers were certainly beginning to tick upward sharply after the Mexican Revolution in 1910, and we would call that initial surge refugees, although that did not yet exist as a legal category in the United States. I would also add that the only thing that resembled the precursor to a border patrol were actually a, a, a small group, in the initial years just a few dozen, of people that were known as Chinese inspectors who uh, rode the entire 1,200 mile plus border on horseback looking for um, Chinese immigrants who were smuggling themselves from Mexico and Canada to the United States after they were barred from entry in 1882. I bring those up because it shows you a different sensibility about the immigrants on which Americans and policymakers were focused. But I want to switch gears now to talk about uh, those from Eastern and Southern Europe. While my first book was about the history of race at the Arizona-Mexico border, and feel free to ask about it, my more recent book, which Professor Hyde mentioned, Inventing the Immigration Problem, um, <clears throat> Uh, is about the largest study of immigrants ever conducted in the United States. The U.S. Immigration Commission was its official title, but it was known as the Dillingham Commission for its chair, um, Senator Dillingham of Vermont. Uh, this joint congressional commission, you can see, was very diverse. That was a joke. It was diverse in that it had three members of Congress, three members of the Senate, and three experts appointed by President Theodore Roosevelt. From 1907 to 1910, the commission and its staff, it had a staff of more than 300, one of them was Anna Herkner. They visited or gathered data on all 46 states and several territories. Well, part of the time there was 45 states, right? I say in the great state of Oklahoma, uh, including Hawaii. Because what's the point of having a um, you know, government commission if you can't have a boondoggle to Hawaii? By its conclusion, <clears throat> the Dillingham Commission, which had been given, and this is a quote, no limit on the time or the expense it may incur, unquote, had spent nearly a million dollars, which was an enormous figure for federal expenditure in 1911. In that four years, its staff of about 360, which incidentally, sorry, it was a little bit less than 360, a majority of its staff were women. And although many people have studied the commission, I was the first to notice this, you might think about why that is. Anyway, uh, and not only did women work for the commission, but several like Anna Herkner actually chaired um, one of the studies and authored reports. They wrote 41 sets of reports. Aren't you glad that you're just getting the 20 minute uh, review? And a potent set of recommendations that shaped immigration policy for generations to come. The final reports had about 29,000 pages. And the full breadth of them boggled the mind, both in page numbers as well as the breadth of geography and topics that sprawled the full reaches of the progressive era mind. 20 reports on immigrants in American industries were thick with numbing and undigested tabulations. You can take my word for that. Various reports considered everything from the head size of new immigrants, a famous study done by the already famous Columbia anthropologist Franz Boas, they studied Anna Herkner's conditions on transatlantic travel, prostitution, what was then called white slavery, what we would understand to be sex trafficking. Um, that was a report written by the first woman lawyer in New Jersey, and everyone that worked on that report was anonymous because they were afraid of retaliation from organized crime. They studied debt peonage, crimes, schools, agriculture, philanthropic societies, other countries' immigration laws to compare them to ours, and immigrant women's fecundity because, of course, many people in the early 20th century were concerned that immigrant women had higher birth rates than native-born white women. This is what Theodore Roosevelt infamously called race suicide and is one of the reasons he had six kids. Reformers in the progressive era advocated and often deployed federal power um, 
by using surveillance, regulation, interstate policing in new ways, and broad powers of deportation to empower the government's ability to exclude immigrants. That was a big mouthful, but I hope you see that those were important antecedents to the expansion of federal power in the realm of immigration policy today. And so I argue that not only, and I'll say more about this in a second, not only did the power of immigration enforcement by the federal government expand in important ways in this time period of the early 20th century, but I believe it set a precedent, for, a precedent for other kinds of expansion of federal power. And so even those people, and I can't imagine who that would be, who might not be interested in immigration policy per se, ought to be interested in it as a kind of harbinger of other kinds of federal power. So that brings me to how this matters today. First, of course, is the similarity of that era to ours. As you may know, 1907 was smack dab in the middle of the era of mass immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, which means that the grandparents and great-grandparents of people my age who are, for example, of Italian or Eastern European Jewish descent, as I am, are almost all the same generation. At the same time, these people who were known I'm sorry, at the same time, these folks were known as new immigrants as opposed to the old immigrants from Germany and Ireland. So um, historians, we're not very hip with the lingo. So we call people from Eastern and Southern Europe from 1880 to 1924 new immigrants, even though, of course, they're not new. And that nomenclature was actually cemented by the Dillingham Commission reports, which divided that that group from 1880 to 1924, who were largely Eastern and Southern European, from what it called the old immigrants. In those years, somewhere around 24 million immigrants came to the United States. They eventually reached almost 15% of the population, a percentage we have come close to but have not exceeded in the last decade, mostly because of the 2009 um, Recession. I'll be honest, I, I shuffled around my slides a little, so I might be a little off. Hold on, let me make sure I find the right thing here. No, 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 see? Maybe I won't show that slide. Maybe it's gone. Uh, yes, here we go. Sorry, it is a little out of order. All right. So one major way that 1920 or 1917, let's back up, differed from today, was that in the so-called progressive era, a growing number of Americans viewed government policy and social reform with optimism and enthusiasm, not cynicism and disdain. <clears throat> this seems downright quaint to us today. They looked to the brand new disciplines of social science, economics in particular, to get answers to what they saw as social problems. And that brings me to the recommendations that the Dillingham Commission made. What is amazing and no doubt a record for a government commission is the fact that almost all of its recommendations were implemented in the next decade or so. Uh, I warned you I was gonna go backwards. Uh, sorry, I switched these up and I, let's just stay there, sorry about that. Okay, the commission's chief recommendation was a literacy test for immigrants along with a continued ban on Asian immigrants, additional regulations and head taxes for entry, and, and this is the money part, for the first time, actual numerical limits on immigration. The literacy test was enacted in 1917. By the way, the literacy test is interesting to us today because the literacy test, which was designed to lower the number of people coming to the United States, with the assumption that poor Eastern and Southern European countries had lower literacy rates was not as draconian as it might seem to us today because you only had to be literate in your native language. And they included Yiddish for Eastern European Jews. But the most important in the long-term recommendation of the Dillingham Commission was the recommendation that some kind of numerical quota be implemented um, uh, in the immigration system. There had never been a numerical limit on immigration prior to this time. And the national origins quota system, which was the eventual product of this recommendation, openly discriminated against Southern and Eastern Europeans. 
It did so by using a formula that created national quotas based on the proportion of immigrants from each country in the 1890 census. Okay, here's what I mean by that. In 1890, not very many Southern and Eastern Europeans had yet immigrated to the United States. By using that as a basis of a formula, whereby 2% each year had a quota of 2% of the people of national origin in that 1890 census. The effect was, if you're not following my math, just stay with me, the effect was that the quotas for people from Southern and Eastern Europe were very small, and the quotas for people from Western and Northern Europe were very large. So not only was that openly discriminatory without actually naming the countries in legislation, but it also was a major change in immigration flows because by that time, 80% of immigration came from Southern and Eastern Europe. So it drastically reversed the sources of immigration by 1924. These recommendations, even as suggestions, and especially once they were enacted, signaled a watershed change because they represented the first time that immigration policy was based on quantitative measures, a quota, rather than qualitative me measures like race, criminal status, disease, or radical political beliefs. Or as people at the time said, these were the first laws that were restrictive rather than regulatory. And in my book, I argue that this climate was made possible because of an equation that looks like this. That's one of their thing. I'll come back to that. The Dillingham Commission released its recommendations in 1911, and then the Red Scare and concern about radicalism in the World War I period, joined by the rise in popularity of the science, and I, and I say science because people considered eugenics a science at the time, uh, of, of eugenics theory that increasingly um, cast um, people from Eastern and Southern Europe as racially inferior, that these together helped yield the immigration restriction laws, particularly the quota law of 1924. Now, fast forward 40 years. In the years after World War II, as the horrors of the Holocaust became clear, these laws were increasingly an embarrassment. First President Truman, then John F. Kennedy, and finally LBJ worked to get rid of these quotas along with allies in Congress. The famous Hart-Celler Act, or Immigration and Nationality Act, passed in 1965. It was and is often considered part of the set of civil rights laws that LBJ signed into law. And it was the long-fought victory of those who hoped to get rid of the discriminatory national origins quota. So instead, the Hart-Celler Act gave every nation the same quota. Now that seems like parody, but it's a perfect example of the difference between equality and equity. Why should Mexico, our next door neighbor, receive the same quota as Switzerland, uh, for example, right? Changing a law overnight, making a quota that is not proportional to the size of an origin country's population or that acknowledges our historical or geographical relationship to a country doesn't make any sense on the ground, even if it looks good in the law that every country has the same quota. Moreover, and again, telling us the ways in which this moment, I'm sorry, the early 20th century was different than today, is that believe it or not, those quotas from 1924 did not include quotas for Latin America. The Western Hemisphere did not have quotas. There was no quota on Mexican immigration in the 1924 law. Think what a contrast in interest that reflected over what kinds of concerns about which peoples the federal government had. And I'll go to this slide, which was a form that the hundreds of employees uh, of the Dillingham Commission would ask people to fill out. So um, they had questionnaires that had as many as 160 questions for immigrants on them. And you can think about how invasive that would be to have a federal agent ask you those questions. Here's one of the shorter ones, but I want you to notice the race categories that they include on the list. And if we had more time, I'd do a Q&A. You can ask me about it later. But I want to I wanna point out a couple things to you. One, American is just white or Negro. And two, Mexican is not even on this list. Magyar, yes. Lithuanian, yes. French Canadian, yes, but no Mexicans. Okay. 
In 1924, policymakers were interested in curbing uh, Asian and Eastern and Southern European immigration, but they barely noticed immigration from Latin America. In fact, the United States government did not even count, did not even keep tally of land crossing migrants until 1908. And recall that the Border Patrol was created in the year of the quotas. All right, but let me return to this issue of the quotas. Why are any of these suggestions or laws surprising? Of course you say, of course we regulate immigration. We could do a better job of it, but it seems normal to have immigration laws. That's what the federal government does. Otherwise, immigration is a problem. That's actually one of the things that I wanted to investigate in this book, because that is one of the jobs of the historian, to say, really? Did we normalize something that actually had origins in a particular moment of time and once might have seemed strange? The short answer in this case, as you might have guessed, I would say, is yes. I argue that the Dillingham Commission's work and recommendations helped bring about something that now seems like common sense, but was in fact then quite a new idea. That immigration is a problem, this was their idea, that the federal government must solve. Now that sounds maybe matter of fact to you now, but in fact, before the progressive era of the early 20th century, it was not clear to most people that either of these, either parts of this supposition was true, that immigration was a problem, or even that if it was, it was necessarily the federal government's to solve. People talked about the immigration question, but restrictions on immigration were almost nil. Even at the height of the anti-Irish nativism of the mid-19th century, to use one of the most famous examples, right? So my students at Georgetown, many of them are Irish Catholic. They all know again about anti-Irish discrimination. Guess what? That's a famous example in American history we often point to. No federal laws in response. There were some state laws, no federal laws. Why is that? Because guess what? In the 1850s, Congress was not excited about expanding federal power. It turns out the Southerners weren't too jazzed about any kind of precedent for expansion of federal power. In 1882, as I mentioned, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was a terrible law. It was the first to restrict immigrants on the basis of class and race. But at least in my view, it was so specifically targeted to one group of people who were among the most reviled in the United States that it's not clear it set any precedent for expansion of other federal laws. And in general, as I've suggested, Americans were very skeptical about federal power in the 19th century, especially in the years following Reconstruction. Here's something else. In the history of immigration policy, the United States has generally had um, a tendency in which Congress has favored legislative approaches to immigration policy because Congress, after all, enacts laws, while presidents have favored the executive power to be flexible with immigration policy. Individual members of Congress are necessarily, in some ways, parochial, right, because they are looking at domestic demands in their home districts where it is not uncommon for their local constituents to consider immigrants uh, an economic or social threat and call for restriction, while presidents, until recently, regardless of party, have often been, in practice, friendlier to immigrants, partly because immigrants, naturalized immigrants and their children make up a large part of the electorate, but equally important for diplomatic reasons. Presidents don't want to go face other heads of state and, sh and, and be hostile to those folks' um, countrymen. And so this has been true, again, until recently, regardless of the party of the president. North, uh, and I want to note here that President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama's stances on immigration reform, at least before 9-11 when Bush changed his policies, actually had a remarkable amount in common. Diplomacy and foreign policy have always been at the center of immigration debates but those have tended to dominate the executive branch's decisions, not Congress's. So it's important to note what an outlier President Trump is in this regard, as in so many things, in being such a hardliner in immigration policy. Presidents from Lincoln to Cleveland to Taft to Wilson to Truman to JFK to Ronald Reagan all spoke and acted in favor of immigration and immigrants in one way or another. Presidents Cleveland, Taft, and Wilson, Wilson twice, 
all vetoed versions of the literacy test precisely because they were concerned about the message that it would send about uh, whether the United States was welcoming to immigrants. And I, need, I, I hardly need to say that these were men of, quite, uh, of two different parties and quite different political sensibilities. All right, so, so what happened? What changed? One of the things I argue in inventing the immigration problem is that the Dillingham Commission had a long-term effect not just on immigration policy, but on how Americans have come to think about federal power in general. Right after the reports were done, the Commission's two most important economists, these guys, Jeremiah Jenks and Jet Locke, published a summary for popular audiences who didn't want to read the 41 volumes, a one-volume summary called The Immigration Problem. And that name, I think, sums up the sensibility of progressive era social scientists, that they describe what they found a problem, right? And the problem was that immigrants were undermining the American standard of living, and the solution was new federal tools of immigration regulation and restriction. I argue that the Dillingham Commission's progressive era formulation of an immigration problem in need of solving with federal bureaucratic power has become so indelibly printed, imprinted into our understanding of the federal government that this logic that there's an immigration problem and there must be a federal government solution now seems entirely natural across almost the entire political spectrum, even if we disagree about numbers and flows and so on. The structural factors that were a product of the 1924 quota laws are evident in our immigration um, flows today. Creating a quota for Mexicans in 1965 didn't change the historical realities of migration patterns, which in many ways were a product of the restriction on Eastern Euro and Southern Europeans after 1924. So we see um, uh, immigration from Mexico rise significantly after 1924 and until 1965 to fill that gap, and it continues today. Now, I've given you um, a lot of information here, and I want to suggest to you that merely overnight the changing of law created undocumented immigration where legal migration flows had once existed, right? That the patterns didn't change, the laws changed. Um, I also just want to point really briefly, and how much time do I have? Because there's not a clock up here of any kind. What? It's 10 o'clock, OK. Um, I will wrap up very shortly. I just want to point to, and you can ask me questions, all of these recent issues, this issue of the likely to become a public charge rule relates to the uh, Immigration Act of 1882. Refugee law is a product of separating immigration law and refugee law in the latter part of the 20th century. Let's think of um, some of uh, my ancestors, Eastern European Jews, we might understand them to be refugees today. They did not come in as refugees because there were no quotas. They could come in as regular immigrants. Family separation and child detention is a really critical one for us to consider, and here's why. With the exception of um, Asian exclusion, which often did separate families, the history of immigration uh, regulation in this country has not included child separation on any large scale. In fact, many, many immigration agents worked at great length both at Ellis Island and at border stations to keep families reunited, including overturning decisions in which some family member was excluded. So we see cases where somebody had a disability, somebody was considered likely to become a public charge, but in fact a supervisor would overturn that decision to keep families together. And I feel it's critical to point out that that is a new development. It is not one that has a strong tradition in, in federal policy. The issue of DACA really gets to this question of federal power and who wields it in immigration policy in important ways. And I want to remind you um, that historians are supposed to have empathy. This is actually one of our core values of our professional association, that we are supposed to practice empathy. Okay, so the last thing that I want to say here, I've just highlighted those bullet points as I promised to, 
is I want to return to my point about the consequences of expanding federal power by way of immigration policy. Consider, for example, the irony of President Donald Trump's then advisor Stephen Bannon in 2017 in the same interview called for a deconstruction of the administrative state even as he advocated a dramatic expansion of federal immigration enforcement and exclusion. That should be paradoxical, but the way in which immigration enforcement at any level to no limits has become naturalized in this sensibility I think is reflected in those two remarks in the same conversation. But conceiving of immigration as a policy problem in the United States was an invention of the progressive era mind and sensibility and one deeply embedded in the way that both bureaucrats and elites saw the relationship between social science and public policy in the progressive era. The irony is that in many, many ways in the supposedly post-fact world we inhabit, we've long since left our confidence in experts and social science behind, and yet we live with the residue of their misguided confidence in immigration policy. I thank you and I look forward to your questions. While Professor Hyde's coming up here, I'm going to just go to a, a last couple slides. Um, this is the uh, border wall um, that I took of this picture in 2013. I'm sure you'll see other pictures of walls. Uh, a couple of my ancestors helped found this cemetery of Eastern European Jews who immigrated to the U.S.-Mexico border. And you'll notice this was taken in about 2018. The wall is behind there. So I want to tell you that the stories we think are separate are really connected. Thank you, Professor Benton Cohen. I want to open the, the floor for questions. Um, there are students out there who have microphones, so wait until someone shows up with a microphone so everyone can hear your question. So there's someone right there. And can you introduce yourself? I always like to know who I'm talking to. Um, my name is Charlie Canny. I'm in the political science department. And I have uh, two points I'd like you to comment on. One is simply that um, it, it might be understood from what you said that there was no immigration problem perceived in the United States before the 1880s. And I don't think that's what you meant to say. Okay. Uh, but that's how it came across. And so if you could comment on the idea that the, um, that anti-immigrant fear, a uh, fear of immigrants and anti-immigrant sentiment is part of the texture of the United States uh, since before the founding. Um, you, you're familiar with the fa famous 1753 letter of Benjamin Franklin right. denouncing the immigration of Germans as destroying our national culture. And we know that political parties and other political movements were organized around anti-immigrant sentiment long before the 1880s. So that would be one point. The other point about the federalization, um, with the impasse in terms of uh, immigration reform, that there has really been nothing that the federal government has been able to do for many years. There was a wave of state level yes. reforms, highly restrictive in character. So it kind of seemed like it reverted to the pre 1880s in some way. And I just wondered if you could comment on that as well. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so the first thing is this is an interesting thing, and I, I hope you'll ask the same question really of everyone today because. I think historians all agree that there is a history of nativism in this country, but I think we differ in what we think that means, right? So um, Professor Crowd and I have a colleague in Washington, Tyler Anbinder, who has done some really interesting work on this question, and he wrote a piece for the Washington Post where he said there's been five, I'm not going to remember what all five they are, I've been embarrassed before by being asked this, but he, he gave five criteria of, of nativism that presidents have expressed in one way or another. And he said only President Trump has exhibited all five. That's, we're all like he's distinctive in some way and we all have different ways that we say it and that was his, okay. But what I mean by this is that I think it's really significant 
that while there have, of course, always been waves of nativism, the consequences have changed dramatically with changing ideas about the power of the state on the state level and the federal level to do something about it. Do you see what I mean? So that's actually one reason why I think this early 20th century and the Dillingham Commission, the, the way in which, these were basically like the first federal experts, right? This guy, Je uh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah Jenks, who was the lead economist on the um, Dillingham Commission, um, historians of social science consider him the first federal expert. He started being appointed to commissions and whatnot by Theodore Roosevelt back in New York. And so I think once, this isn't a word I want to use, how do I say this? Um, once federal expansion of federal power into the immigration bureaucracy became um, one way to address nativism, then it becomes, in my view, okay, I will use it, much more weaponized. Um, because at the end of the day, while there were nasty nativists before, they didn't accomplish a whole lot on a macro level. So that's my take. There are ranges of opinions on this question of the history of nativism. I mean, Ben Franklin did not stop Germans from coming to Pennsylvania. Right? I mean, he could rant all he wanted, but that wasn't the consequence. Same with the know-nothings in the 1850s. There's still a lot of Irish Americans, you know? Um, uh, with respect to the second question, yes, there's a lot of interesting work, and I suspect some of the subsequent speakers will talk about this, and I'm from Arizona, and my book on Arizona and the border came out minutes before SB 1070 was passed. Uh, which was weird because people said, oh, you're so lucky that your book came out at such a good time. And I was like, that's a really sick way of looking at it because I'm not in favor of SB 1070 and I don't want to uh, uh, have this be that moment. But um, yeah, as you may know, um, you know, liberals today, these are terms that don't translate over time very well, but the left um, has wanted, you know, and many people, moderates, have wanted comprehensive immigration reform for a long time on the federal level and bemoaned with good reason uh, Arizona's SB 1070 and its copycats in places like Mississippi and Alabama and so on, North Carolina. But uh, now uh, many people are looking to the states, particularly California is one example, I think Illinois, for creative state level solutions. And there is a wonderful historiography. There's a relatively um, new book by a great young historian named Hidetaka Hirota about the state origins of many of the early federal policies, which were very much modeled on laws in um, Massachusetts and New York that were designed, many of them were public health laws, were designed to limit Irish Americans from coming ashore uh, in the United States or quarantining them and so on. Um, so yes, there's been a, well, maybe federalism will be useful to us now turn um, among some um, progressives who felt that, um, you know, who don't see immigration reform happening anytime soon. So thank you for bringing those to our attention. You have to wait for a mic. She's, she, here it comes. I see you. You can put your phone down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My name is Artie Fagan. I'm a graduate of the law school here, an undergraduate. Uh, my parents, um, grand, my grandparents, were, came, were Jewish, came from Eastern Europe. And I'm wondering, they had great difficulty, my grandparents, when they were in New York, Brooklyn, Delancey Street, where all the Jews were, and many of them at that time. But when they came west, and they came west, things were very different, and they were very successful. I wonder if that experience is fairly common, as compared to the Eastern United States to the West during the late 1800s and early 1900s? Yeah, so I thank you for that question because I can't help but give a slightly uh, genealogical answer that my ancestors can't, you know, this looks pretty crowded. This, not so much. Uh, this is where my Eastern European Jewish ancestors came and, um, you know, when I was growing up, my mother grew up in El Paso and I thought everyone in El Paso was Jewish or Mexican. It turns out that's not true, uh, but that was my perspective. Um, and. Um, my point is that, yes, there's lots of studies that, in fact, Jews who went to the West and South found significantly less anti-Semitism. They were sort of white in ways that were a little bit more difficult to achieve. They faced a lot less uh, redlining, uh, social exclusions like country clubs and so on. Um, 
Greenwood, Mississippi had a Jewish mayor. Tombstone, Arizona had a Jewish mayor. Um, and just one more thing, I didn't mention it because it was a sidebar and it didn't work. But one of the things that the Dillingham Commission was super interested in doing was it created basically a, a bureau, they called it Bureau of Information, which sounds a little creepy, but it was actually just a publicity bureau to encourage new immigrants to distribute themselves to the West and the South and the Midwest. They did not think these immigrants were, in, were um, racially inferior, unlike the later eugenicists. In fact, they thought, you know, if you would just move to Texas, if you would just move to Iowa, we could, we could alleviate people's concerns about urban overcrowding and assimilate you a little bit better. So you are right that that reflected a certain kind of sensibility. The numbers weren't large enough to make a difference, but it did happen. Maybe one more question? Keep going. Raise your hand again, ma'am. There you go. Do you want to hold it or do you want me to hold it? Oh, you want to hold it. Okay. Um, I just, you talked a lot about immigration restrictions. Can you speak a little about the incredible opening, wasn't it, in the 60s? Yes. Of immigrants into the United States that has somehow fueled this thinking among people who are friends of President Trump's. Uh, I can. I bet other people are going to say more about this, but it is certainly true that the reforms of 1965, oh, I just unglued something that was supposed to stay there. Sorry. Um, the reforms of 1965, in part because they included family reunification, expanded the numbers of immigrants in ways that supposedly surprised the writers of the legislation, but more important, I think, with regard to this history of nativism, they dramatically shifted where immigrants were coming from to the United States. So that's when we see a drastic expansion in immigration from Latin America and from Asia and to some extent from Africa, and that surprised and alarmed many people with a kind of racial nativism that's one of the brands of nativism. Um, but it's a good question, and I suspect other people are going to say more about it. And since I'm getting a 60-second mark, I think maybe we'll take, we'll let Anne uh, close us up here. So thank you very thank, much. Let's, let's thank Professor Benton Cohen. And we have a quick break, and we'll be back with the next speaker at 10.30. Thank you.
Good morning. I love the response. This makes me so happy. I, it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Cesar Cuatema Garcia Hernandez, who is going to be speaking about his book, Migrating to Prison, America's Obsession with Locking Up Immigrants. Um, Professor Garcia Hernandez teaches at the University of Denver, Sturm College of Law. And um, this book is wonderful. I've had the chance to read it. I encourage everybody to go out and buy a copy. There's also some at the Bazell. Um, it's a really quick, amazing read um, that gives us a great amount of information about the United States' reliance on prisons to enforce immigration law. And I'll just cite one person uh, or one, one review. Um, Kirkus called it a chilling, timely overview of the American tendency to first exploit and then criminalize migrants. Um, Cesar speaks all over um, about his work. He is someone you might hear on NPR as you drive to work tomorrow or read in the New York Times or The Guardian or Newsweek or Salon or MSNBC or BBC, uh, CNN. You, you will find him all over the place. And he also publishes a blog that is wonderful resource, crimmigration Com. It's a blog about the convergence of immigration law and criminal law, which is his specialty. And his first book, Crimmigration Law, is actually one that my students know because it is assigned reading in my class. So I've long been a fan. I'm thrilled to have him here. Please welcome Professor Garcia Hernandez. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. It's, a, it's an honor to, to be at the University of Oklahoma for this fantastic uh, event. Uh, thank you to, to Justin for inviting me. Thank you to, to Kit for uh, the introduction, and of course to Helen Green for all of the work that um, went into making sure that I and everyone else um, was able to get here today. So, um, uh, like, like, like uh, Professor Johnson just says, and my, my focus is certainly on, on, on migration, and, and, and I, um, uh, uh, I'll be talking about Migrating to Prison, this uh, book that I, I recently published. Um, but before I, I jump into the substance of the book, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I'll give you a little bit of context um, about um, myself. Um, is the microphone working okay? Yeah, uh, so I think if somebody can raise the volume on the mic, that'd be great. Right. Well, yeah, I'll try not to move, but um, if, if y'all have a lav mic, I'll take that. Um, but um, for me, um, so to give you a little bit more context about, about myself, um, about the, uh, as in why it is that I decided to, to, to focus on the use of incarceration um, as, a for, as a means of enforcing immigration law, um, um, I think it's, it's helpful to have a sense of where I come to this work from. Um, so migration has always been a part of, of my lived experience. I was born and raised in McAllen, Texas, which is a city um, just a few miles north of the, the Rio Grande River and South Texas, the area of South Texas. And, in uh, northern Mexico, in the southeastern part of, of Texas. Um, and at that time, um, like now, my, my family straddled that, it, that international boundary. Um, my parents' work did for a time. My, my father was, uh, my, my family was living in, uh, in, on the Mexican side of the border. My father was working on the U.S. side. Uh, my siblings' births straddled that border, as was uh, common then and, and remains common. Um, my my, my, my uh, siblings, most of my siblings were born in, in Texas, um, but while my family was living in, in Reynosa, which is a, uh, a fairly large uh, city right on the um, Mexican uh, side of the border. Um, and so my daily existence did. My, their daily existence, my daily existence did. Um, border, border crossings were we're just a routine facet of, of life for us, for, for, for visiting family, um, for, for shopping, for, for, for lunch, um, for, for medical appointments. We had very much a binational existence. We had a bicultural existence, we do. Um, 
and very much a bilingual experience. And, and that allowed me, that allowed my family um, to, to be comfortable in two worlds, in two countries. Um, but it also allowed us um, uh, a sense of being comfortable in what I think of, uh, what I think is, is very much a singular experience. It is the distinct experience of life in the borderlands. And, uh, and it's there in that region of South Texas and Northern Mexico that my parents managed to raise five kids in a migrant farm worker housing project uh, by doing what many other folks have had to do in, uh, all over the place, uh, by scrimping at times, by scrounging at times. Uh, I remember very clearly um, when, when we were young, we, we, we'd go to um, high school football games, and, and there's just being Texas, like Oklahoma, um, there's no shortage of high school football game opportunities. O only we would not go for the games, we would go when the games were winding down toward the end of the fourth quarter um, because we were there to walk through the stands after the people left. Uh, we were there to collect the empty cans um, because the aluminum was recyclable. And we weren't doing it because of any sense of environmental stewardship, we were doing it because there was a, a recycling plant in McAllen that would pay us for, for taking large trash bags full of empty cans. Um, we, we did this um, for, for most of our, of, of, of our childhood. Um, and we did this because my parents didn't have, my, our family didn't have very much money. Uh, my father worked in a hardware store for most of his adult life. Uh, my mother cleaned homes for most of, of her, of her um, working life. Um, and, and that was our situation because my parents didn't have a whole lot of uh, formal education. My father finished high school in, in McAllen, in Texas. Um, my mom finished the third grade uh, and in, her, in the um, small town in the central state of, uh, of Querétaro, which is in the, in the central Mexican state of, of, of Querétaro. Um, and, and as the story goes, um, she finished the third grade uh, twice. Um, and it wasn't because of any, uh, because she was doing poorly. Um, it, it was on the, on the contrary, because she really liked school. Um, but the thing is, school only went through the third grade for her, for in, her in her community. Um, and so she was able to, to convince her parents, her, her father, to allow her to, to go an additional year of, to school. And, uh, and so that meant she had to, to, to do third grade twice. Um, but of course, the, the point being that they, they didn't have much by way of formal education. And, and to this day, I don't know if it's because of that or, or despite that, um, but whatever the reason was, education was absolutely everything to, to my parents when it came to, to my siblings and, and to me, to their kids. They filled my mind with the ambition for learning that they had simply been unable to access for themselves. And, and in that way, they, they, they prepared me to thrive in worlds that not only did I not know existed, but of course that they didn't know existed. This, uh, this, is, this, this continues to be true today. Um, my, my father's passed away now, but my mom still struggles to understand what it is I do for a living. Right? You're a lawyer, but like, you don't actually, like, you don't go to an office and represent clients, right? But you're a teacher, but you're a teacher, but what are you doing right now? Like you just travel around talking to people about this book that you wrote. Um, tenures, like they can't fire you. Like wh how, what does that mean that they can't, like you don't have, well, who's your boss, right? No, it's definitely not, not the dean, um, just, 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 just to be clear. Um, so, so, so it was certainly very much a, 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 a um, yeah, and, and not, not necessarily a, a unique experience. And my, my family certainly is not the only one to have ever been in circumstances like these. Um, but it was a defining experience. And, and when I left that in-between space of the borderlands, what's often referred to as an area that's ni de aquí, ni de allá, not from here, nor from there, I found myself startled and unmoored in this next context in which I found myself, which was college. I, I was studying, I went to college in, in Rhode Island. Um, in New England, and I was so, so clueless about what I was getting into um, that when I, my, my parents and my, my two brothers and I were driving to Rhode Island, we were waiting to cross a bridge because that's what you do when you drive into, onto an island. Um, 
And if you if you've ever been to Rhode Island, um, you would know that there it's not actually an island, um, so there is no no bridge. Uh, I now know that, um, but now but not at the time. So I was completely clueless about what was going on, and, and needless to say, I, I continued being clueless, um, come unmoored when I got to campus. I was, I was studying at Brown University, and the amount of wealth that was uh, um, on display there institutionally and also individually in the students um, was, was absolutely um, uh, beyond my comprehension. Um, so I was disoriented there. I was disoriented a few years later when I returned to school to pursue a law degree. Uh, but in both of those instances, I, I eventually found the courage to transcend in that childhood of crossing boundaries. And it was through those experiences far away from that community in South Texas and Northern Mexico that breathed life, in, life into me that I was able to see what had not been apparent to me as a child. As a kid, knowing no other way of of, of doing things, no other way of life, I'd been unable to see the power that the border had over the bodies that tried to cross it. I did not know that, um, the, that the border patrol, that La Migra, was not an everyday feature of life for, as experienced by most people in the United States. I did not know that the immigration checkpoints that were um, permanently, permanently located an hour north of my home in South Texas, that they would raise eyebrows in, in other parts of the United States. I did not know that there was anything unusual about having a Theo occasionally sleeping on our couch in the living room as he was trying to make his way north to go to work. I did not realize the power that the law had in, in my daily experience, in the daily experiences of the people who were, in, in, who were my community, who, were my, my, who are my family, um, until I, I, took, I, w I had the opportunity to get out of that comfort zone and reflect on where it was that I'd been. And even then, though, there was one facet of life in that community that remained hidden from me until I returned to the region as a newly minted lawyer the shiny bar card in hand, and I started representing clients who were facing deportation proceedings alongside my two brothers in our, in our um, small family, family law firm. And that facet of life that, had, that continued to remain hidden from my view until then was the focus of my, my latest book, Migrating to Prison, Immigration Prisons. Because all of a sudden, I found myself representing clients who were stuck inside detention centers that I had not known existed. Sometimes these facilities were surrounded by onion fields. Other times, they were tucked into gorgeous wildlife refuges. And I remember very clearly the first time that I drove to one of these facilities, the Port Isabel Detention Center. It's about 1,500 beds. It's been there since the mid-1980s. And, and I remember driving through there looking at these gorgeous white birds and that were, that were, that were um, uh, uh, just sort of hanging around these, these um, uh, native uh, ponds called resacas. Um, and, and, and I'd never seen anything like that before. They're, they're white egrets. I know that now. I didn't know that at the time. Um, and, and I remember driving through there wondering how it is that this place had existed that, without me knowing given that I'd spent most of my life there at, uh, up until that time. Um, and, and, and I kept driving, and eventually I, I, I get to the guardhouse at the perimeter of the Port Isabel Detention Center. Um, and off in the distance, you can see there's the, 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 the um, fencing that surrounds the, the high um, or the, the concrete um, uh, walls of the, of the prison facility. Um, and just to get to the parking lot, you have to go through one security checkpoint. And then you park, and in order to get inside the facility, you go to a second layer of security checkpoints. And inside the facility, there are steel doors. There are surveillance cameras watching every move. There are escorts who uh, accompany people like, like me. The, the rare attorney going inside to meet with a client in a cinder block room. And I say the rare attorney because 
in the prison network that is run by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, like the Port Isabel Detention Center, most of the folks who are going through the immigration court process while they're locked up in places like that don't have access to a lawyer. We used to joke back when I was, when I was um, working alongside my brothers full time um, that we were the largest immigration prison, uh, the, the largest uh, law firm in, 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 the, in the region that went inside these facilities. There were three of us. And then never got around to actually verifying whether that was true, so, so it might not have been, but it was, it was close enough. Now, I'm now privileged to call myself a, a law professor, a teacher, a, a writer, and I've been more, writing for more than a decade about this intersection between criminal law and immigration law and about the criminalization of migrants, migrants themselves. And incarceration is just the harshest reality of this trend. It's the part of immigration policing that led to the death of a man named Kamyar Samimi. Mr. Samimi had been in the United States for about 40 years. He had a green card. And one day I showed up, Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents showed up at his door, at home, and they arrested him and they took him down to an immigration prison, a private immigration prison in, in, in Aurora, Colorado, a suburb of Denver. And despite 40 years in the United States, within two weeks, he was dead. And the press release that the government, the, the, that the government issued soon thereafter said that Mr. Samimi died suddenly. But the internal governmental investigation report that was released only a year later after an open records request by a local journalist and a separate lawsuit by the local ACLU said that the nurses at the facility had not followed the, inst the medical instructions issued by the doctor. So immigration prisons are the places where the government, where our government oftentimes oversees suffering. They're the places where the quality of life suffers and indeed at times where life goes to end as it did with Mr. Samimi. And so, so, so I've, con I've concluded that immigration prisons are, 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 are not defensible. In, in, in this latest book, Migrating to Prisons, migrating to prison, I trace how the United States at one point in our history got really close to shutting down almost all, all of the immigration prisons that existed, on, uh, existed at the time. And then how for the next 25 years or so, life went on without them. And then I, I also describe how starting in the late 1970s, the United States began to build the largest immigration prison system in the world. Today, the United States ro locks up roughly four or 500,000 people every single year because the government thinks that they violated immigration law. In immigration prisons, there are people who are held under the power of what lawyers call civil law because the government says that they might not belong here, that they instead belong somewhere else over some border somewhere. And there are also people who are being held under the power of criminal law because the government says that they should be punished for having come here. Today, immigration prisons are just about everywhere and they take just about every form. From an old motel in Tucson sitting along Interstate 10, to a concrete fortress of 1,400 beds in Tacoma, a suburb of Washington. Now some people are there because the, the government has given them permission to be here and now wants to strip them of that permission to be here. Take Jerry Armijo, who I write about in Migrating to Prison. Uh, Jerry was raised in South Texas, not far from, from where I grew up. We were both raised in this poor, overwhelmingly Mexican community. Only I was born north of the Rio Grande River, and Jerry was born on its southern side. And that means that I was born a United States citizen, and Jerry was not. And after high school, I went off to the Ivy League, and um, I was being shocked by a different culture. And Jerry joined the U.S. Army. And he got deployed to Iraq, where he was being shocked by bombs. And one day as Jerry was patrolling in his tank on behalf of the US Army, his tank went over an IED. 
And that IED blasted right through the bottom of the vehicle. It injured Jerry's leg. It gave him some trauma, PTSD. And he got sent back to Texas to get better. Only when he got there, he didn't get the care that he needed. And so, like many people before him and after him, Jerry started to self-medicate with drugs. Eventually, the police caught up with him, and he was going through the criminal justice system. He was going, he was participating in a special court set up specifically for veterans, specifically out of a recognition that oftentimes the trauma of war manifests in harmful ways, in antisocial ways, when those soldiers come back to their homes. And he was doing exactly as the judge asked him, asked of him. Until one day, all of a sudden, he just stopped showing up to court. Turns out, ICE had picked him up. And they'd sent him to one of their local immigration prisons, the Port Isabel Detention Center, where they were starting the process of deporting Jerry. Because Jerry was not a U.S. citizen. He's still not. A U.S. citizen. So one bomb, a shoddy mental health care system, and as Jerry will readily admit, a few bad decisions later, and all of a sudden, Jerry had been transformed from what politicians like to refer to as a as a as a war hero or as a wounded warrior to a criminal alien. So Jerry had the government's permission to be here, and they were trying to take that away from him. But there are other folks who are locked up in some of these facilities who are there because they dare to seek safety in the United States. Federal law is clear that anyone who is physically present in the United States and who is afraid for their life can ask for asylum. It does not matter where you came from. It does not matter how you got here. And yet, coming to the United States without the federal government's permission is also a federal crime. And that's why in the summer of 2018, we all saw immigration officials taking children away from their parents. And the kids were being sent off to places like that old motel in Tucson that instead of having a sign at the door welcoming guests, now it has a sign that's warning away visitors. And instead of having a round-the-clock help at the front desk, now it has a round-the-clock surveillance cameras making sure that no one leaves without permission. And while the kids were in places like that, the parents were being prosecuted in federal courthouses like the one in McAllen, Texas, for having violated federal immigration crime. Now, before then and after then, parents have been confined alongside their parents, uh, alongside their kids. Kids like Diego Osorio Rivera. When, when Diego was just one year old, his mother, Wendy, decided that life in Honduras had become too dangerous for them to stay. And so like people from all over the world have done for generations, Diego and Wendy decided to come to the United States for safety. And when they got here, in one of those miraculous ways that are wholly ordinary for many migrants, they asked for asylum. And within a few days, they found themselves inside an old nursing home outside of Philadelphia. ICE calls it a family residential center, but critics prefer the phrase baby jail. Now, Diego and Wendy were stuck inside that old nursing home, waiting for the legal process to slowly grind forward. Remember, I said Diego was just one year old when he got here. He turned two inside that facility, and then he turned three inside that facility. And eventually, he won his legal claim to stay in the United States, but not before 650 nights had passed. To run this immigration prison system, the federal government relies primarily on five agencies. There's the Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement Divisions of the Department of Homeland Security. There's the U.S. Marshal Service, uh, there's the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and there's the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement. Uh, primarily through its Border Patrol agents, CBP, Customs and Border Patrol uh, Protection, Ag uh, Protection Agency, 
apprehends and detains people along the, the border, primarily the southwestern border, who it suspects of having entered the United States without the government's permission. And it keeps them in small cells that are, typically, that are designed for short-term uh, use, most commonly inside of border patrol stations. In, in my native South Texas, these often resemble large, really large dog kennels. These are enormous, enormous cages built of cane, ca uh, chain link fencing that are tucked inside the warehouse looking parts of um, Border Patrol stations. The CBP's cousin agency within, within DHS, ICE, is responsible for detaining people who the federal government is trying to figure out whether they're gonna be allowed to remain in the United States. And to do this, it, run, it relies on hundreds of facilities across the country, most of which are nothing more than county jails. ICE is just renting bed space from usually the county sheriff. Now others are standalone facilities that are operated by private prison corporations. And the two largest uh, players in this market are Core Civic and the Geo Group. And, and each of them, um, or collectively rather, they, 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 they make up about uh, two thirds um, to three quarters of um, the entire population of ISIS um, detainees. Uh, for, for its part, the U.S. Marshal Service is responsible for pretrial confinement of migrants who are suspected of violating a federal immigration crime, and more than people suspected of, of violent crimes or financial crimes, um, immigration crime defendants are the most likely type of federal suspect to be detained pending prosecution. Now, upon conviction, and most of these folks will be convicted, they're handed over to the Bureau of Prisons uh, for punishment, and the BOP in turn sends them into its network of, uh, of prisons. And the last of the federal agencies with a large role is the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which doesn't run its um, own facilities anywhere. It contracts with nonprofits. And its main customer is an agency called uh, uh, Southwest Keys, which is based in Austin, Texas, that runs about two dozen sites. In Tucson, Southwest Keys runs that old motel, um, down in Brownsville, Texas, it uses an old Walmart. Uh, every year, roughly four, or 500,000 people um, told or are deprived of the, the, their liberty because they violated immigration law, or at least because federal officials claim that they did. And as some people enter um, and others exit the nation's immigration prisons, uh, migrants are being uh, counted. Um, the federal government alone uh, spends billions of dollars on immigration prisons every year, 2.7 billion in 2017, just for the ICE detention network. Um, and this large S is welcome news for the private businesses and uh, local governments. Core Civic and GEO both get about 50% of their revenue from the federal government, and with that, they hire people. They hire people in out-of-the-way locations where decent paid jobs are sometimes difficult to, to come by. And 3,000 person Milan, New Mexico, and about an hour and a half uh, west of Albuquerque, 300 people work for Core Civic. And to elected officials, the threat to their high employment private prison is a threat to their reelection campaigns. In 2015, to give you just one example, inmates at the Willacy County Detention Center in Raymondville, Texas, left it uninhabitable. And I was not surprised because I'd represented clients there, and it was, it was always chaotic. The Bureau of Prisons, though, which was um, under contract with the Management and Training Corporation, the private prison that ran it, um, the Bureau of Prisons pulled its convicted immigration offenders out of that facility and ended its contract with Management and Training Corporation after that incident. And a few years later, in 2018, the facility uh, was uh, reopened, but this time it had a different uh, customer, federal government agency customer, ICE. And now it houses the people who are facing the possibility of removal from the United States. And when the refurbished prison was ramping up to reopen, the elected county judge in, in um, Willacy County, um, Texas, which is uh, in South Texas, said this. He said, they are committed to the well-being of the people in their care. As you know, the last few years have been financially challenging for the county. So we look forward to this new facility and the economic benefits it will bring to our area. Well, why is the county so interested? It owns the prison. MTC just runs it. And having prisoners on the inside means that MTC can hire guards and it can hire nurses and it also means that the county can pay its bills. So these uh, private, uh, uh, private and public immigration prisons have support all the way from Washington down to Willacy County and so it would seem that the future is quite bright for immigration prisons. 
In this topsy-turvy world, our collective moral compass has swerved to the point where we no longer debate whether we ought to be detaining children. Instead, locking up children with their mothers is offered as the humanitarian response to separating children from their parents. So when that is our reality, then imaginations have already run wild. When what was once a fantasy for some and a nightmare for others has become policy for all of us. So if nightmares can become a reality, then why can't dreams? So I imagine a future without immigration prisons, which I know is not a small task. To begin, though, it's, I, I think it's, it's, it is possible, though. And to begin, let me point out that at one point we came close to doing this. Most people think of Ellis Island as that place that welcomed generations of newcomers to the United States. And it did that. But it was also an immigration prison with an ironic view of the Statue of Liberty. One woman who was held there in the late 1940s and the early 1950s recalls in her memoir, a woman named Ellen Knopf, recalls in her memoir approaching the facility for the first time and she said it had, it had the look of, of, of a group of kennels. A group of kennels. Just like today, in that period in the late 40s and the 50s, immigration prisons like the one on Ellis Island were said to protect us from ungodly dangers. Now today it's gang members, or terrorists. But back then, it was communists. The Soviet Union was recovering from that immense pounding that it had taken during World War II. The Cold War had started, and it was not just ideological fights that were being had. It had turned into actual military engagements in places like Korea. And that little speck of land off the coast of southern Manhattan was supposed to keep us safe from people like that woman, Ellen Knopf. By the 1950s, when Ellen Knopf was held there, she was the wife of a veteran of the U.S. Army. She fled Czechoslovakia, where she'd been born as the war got started. She made her way to the UK where she worked for the Royal Air Force. Then she worked for the US. And that's how she met Kurt Knopf, US citizen and veteran of the US Army. They got married in Germany with the permission of the commanding officer. And thanks to a special procedure enacted by Congress, specifically to allow soldiers to bring their new wives back to their homes, a law called the War Brides Act. She came to the United States. She arrived in New York, and she was told, you cannot step foot inside the United States. You cannot come into the United States because your presence is prejudicial to our interests. But we won't tell you why. We won't tell you what that evidence is. And so you can either go back, or you can wait in these restrictive quarters of the Ellis Island station. So she went to Ellis Island, and she insisted on being allowed to join her new family. Insisted all the way to the Supreme Court, where she found no luck. She was confined there. Until eventually she, she found no luck at the Supreme Court. She did find luck in editorial boards. She did find luck in members of Congress, so she was able to pressure the Attorney General to give her a hearing, not because the Attorney General was required to, but because the Attorney General wanted to. And so it eventually turns out that the government wasn't comfortable with the secret evidence. They never really disclosed what it was, but they did say it was just hearsay. It was just rumor. So eventually she was able to get off the island um, and, and, and join her new family, and eventually that relationship um, fell apart. It's never, never, never ideal to start a, 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 a new marriage with one, one half of the couple being locked up for two years. So that by the time that Ellen was on the LSIM facility, she was in the facility, it was old. 
It had been around for a few decades and needed to be repaired, replaced, and discarded. And in the White House at the time was the war hero turned, the Republican, turned, turned Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower. And yet, instead of fixing up the facility, Eisenhower chose to shut it down. On November 11, 1954, his attorney general, a man named Herbert Brownell, went to a naturalization proceeding on El, uh, on, at Ebbets Field, home of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And while he was there, he announced a new position that the government was to take. He said, today, the little island between the Statue of Liberty and the skyline and piers of New York seems to have served its purpose. A few days later, the New York Times reported the last detained alien, a Norwegian seaman who had overstayed his shore leave, was a passenger on the battery-bound ferry. Well, that overstay language is important because in immigration law, overstay means you had the government's permission to come here. And that time came and went, and you are still here. You are in violation of immigration law now. And so this was a time when, yes, people were violating immigration law, and yes, the government knew about it. This Norwegian seaman, his name was Arne Peterson, was violating immigration law. The U.S. government knew it, and the U.S. government had him in its possession, and it was the U.S. government that put him on a ferry into southern Manhattan. And neither the U.S. government nor anyone else knows what happened to Mr. Peterson after that day. So if the Cold War wasn't enough to stop Eisenhower from shutting down immigration prisons, then I think it's time for us, 65 years later, to be equally courageous. I think we have to stop constraining our vision of what is deemed to be possible. And so I'll close with um, a line from a man who knew how to blow, blow fire onto pages, James Baldwin. Who, who in his essay, The Fire Next Time, says this. He writes, I know that what I'm asking is impossible, but in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand. We have to ask for the impossible because we know what happens if we don't alter course. But instead of getting mired in all of that despair, I hope that we can push our country toward a future that at least when it comes to the lack of immigration in prisons, looks a bit more like our past than it does our present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to open the floor now for questions. If anybody has a question, raise a hand and we will get a microphone to you. Um, so everyone can hear your question. So I'm Mari Fagan. I'm a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Uh, so Eisenhower closed the immigration prisons. Under whose administration were they reopened? And what is the, a brief history of that? Thank you for that question. Um, the, the, um, the Carter administration. Um, in the late 1970s, um, we started seeing an increase in the number of Haitians who were coming to the United States fleeing the Duvalier regime. Um, and, and caught off guard. The Carter administration started rounding people up sending them into, onto military bases, sending them into federal penitentiaries, um, wherever they could find space. Um, that was the very end of the 1970s. Reagan um, uh, 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 enters the White House soon thereafter. Um, and it's in that moment that um, we start seeing an increase in the number of Cubans coming to the United States, um, but primarily poor and primarily dark-skinned Cubans. Um, uh, who, who were in, in the time, at the time, described in prominent um, media and political circles as being um, uh, the, sort of the cast-offs from Castro's prisons. The best example of this that I can give you is a fictional example, um, Scarface. In the 1980s Al Pacino blockbuster, um, the very opening scene, it's a horrible movie, so don't watch it, but I do recommend the first 30 seconds or so. Um, opening scene, is um, described, there's some text that appears, um, and, 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 and it's describing, uh, setting the, the stage as uh, being uh, focused on this one um, character named Tony Montana. Um, 
but it describes him as having come to the United States as part of this group of, of migrants who leave the, uh, the, the island from the port of Mariel. And it says, uh, these, these people were, the, the, the movie says, the, 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 the dregs of society. Right? This is a sensationalized version of a very real conversation that was happening at the time. Um, not at all coincidental is the fact that the Haitians and the Cubans who were coming in this moment were, were poor people and were, were um, dark-skinned, black, uh, black or, dar or, or dark-skinned uh, um, um, individuals. And so Carter begins it, Reagan formalizes it. This is probably not an area that you would want to explore, but the horror of having these children removed from their parents has also a psychological effect for our country or wherever they end up, because a child psychiatrist friend of mine listed in Who's Who in America told me that between the ages of five to seven, a child makes a decision as to whether the world is safe or dangerous and what that can do to a child's brain and their beliefs and their reactions in the future can be very, very bad. And what is happening to these children is far beyond just the physical imprisonment. Thank you for that comment. That's, a, that's in part why um, the United Nations, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, other, other um, uh, um, uh, interested societies of, of that type um, uh, are, have very categorical position that children should never be confined um, in, in for any for any reason um, what's, whatsoever. And, and um, you know, I often get the question, well, 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 this is these are not um, these are not maximum security prisons. No, they're not maximum security prisons, right? These are, they, every every jail looks somewhat different. Every prison looks somewhat different. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you know, you're putting people there against their will, um, and you're you're not allowing them to 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 leave, right? For 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 months or for somebody like Diego, um, for for two years, um, you can no amount of success in court can ever undo those 650 nights that Diego spent locked up in that facility. I think we might have time for one more question. If when it, the very back row there. My name is Jamie Lucas, and I'm a graduate of the University of Oklahoma, and I'm also a high school teacher. And um, in the small community I teach high school, we are more than 70% Native American. And I'm curious because I feel like um, our immigrants that we're talking about today mostly are about the Mexican Americans. And I wonder if you've, because the first lecturer said we have difficulty defining nativism, well, we're in Native America, and I'm just curious because I don't feel like um, the immigration's a problem on the Canadian side because they're not the same skin color. And when I had students who were offended that they were called Native Americans, we have Johnson O'Malley, which is, they give school supplies to Native Americans, so when they ask if Anybody would like some JOM supplies? And I look at students and say, would anybody like to go get some supplies? I've had several offended that, that I thought they were Native American because they were Mexican. And I was like, well, pardon me. I just, sorry that I misunderstood because to me, I felt like um, Mexican Americans were Native North Americans. And I just wonder if um, you feel as if you're a Native American, and if you feel like that the 
immigration problem is mainly skin color problem. Yeah, so as, as I um, uh, recounted early on in, in, in my, my remarks, I mean, my, my uh, family came to the United States um, fairly, fairly recently um, from, from Mexico. So that's, sort of, that's my, my understanding of my own identity. I embrace that understanding, um, and um, and and um, and I'm, I'm quite proud of that of that um, that history and that that struggle to allow me to to have the opportunities that I now I now do. But I think this larger um, uh, point about um, the the so complicated interweaving of racism in the United States is, 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 a, is an extremely uh, um, important part of this story because um, racism isn't unidimensional. Right? It's, not one, it's not white people just sort of, uh, uh, um, um, imposing that on people of color because, of course, people of color are, the, among ourselves, very heter heterogeneous. Um, and and um, you know, there, there's a, there is certainly a strain among communities of color that is, uh, is, is quite virulently racist, um, even today. Um, there is a hierarchy of, of, uh, um, of, of, of social privilege in the United States um, that most of us have a vested interest in trying not to be at the bottom of. Um, and unfortunately, that's the reality in, the situ in circumstances where we do have a, such a poor sa safety net, um, where the stakes are so high, um, and, and where the, the cleavages um, uh, historically and to this day have uh, quite often been, been marked by, um, by racialization. Um, and, and that's unfortunately the reality that, we're, that we've been struggling with as a, as a political community for most of the history of this, of this nation. Um, thank you very much, Professor Garcia Hernandez. Thank um, you all. For coming with us today. We will now adjourn until after lunch. If you RSVP to attend lunch, please join us across the street in the Sandy Bell Gallery of the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art, and event staff will be in the lobby to direct you to that. So hope to see you there.
comfortable using your yeah. No, it's fine. I have notes. As long as I can read the notes off of it. Otherwise, I know that's pretty much what we're talking about. Okay. No, I don't. Let's let's see if it works. Yeah. Well, then the, if you have to switch out, I I totally get it. Um, this Apple changes the connectors like every every two weeks. <laughs>
you have a talk at Rice in two weeks, and they just emailed. I think Rice actually shut closed for two weeks, like totally closed. And I think that sounds like it's working. Yeah. Test, test. Yeah. I can I can move it up a little bit. I don't. Is that not enough? Okay. I can try and move it up on my tie too, if that helps. I'm, okay. Oh, I know, I know. I, you know, I've done, I've done some talks <laughs> for like continuing education. O we have Osher Lifelong Learning. When I was at UC San Diego at Osher Lifelong Learning, and they, I shouldn't say this because this is like. Are we okay? Can I take it off? Are you still checking? Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're in classrooms together, and they're, it's like a group of junior high kids. Like, somebody will ask a question. Oh, wow, that's, that's hot. Is that all right? Okay, test one, two, three, test one, two, three. I think this sounds pretty good. I don't. I sound amplified for sure. Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Oh yeah, okay. I'm gonna just put this up here and I'll pick it up before I talk.
Check, check, one, two. Okay.
everyone. I hope you all had a good lunch. Thanks again for making it out here today um, to this teach-in and our organizers for putting it together. Uh, our next speaker is Tomas Jimenez, um, coming from Stanford University, where he is a professor of sociology and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. Uh, he's also the director of graduate studies in sociology and director of the undergraduate program on urban studies. His research and writing focuses on immigration, assimilation, social mobility, and ethnic, ethnic and racial identity. He's the author of multiple books and uh, articles, including uh, a book called The Other Side of Assimilation, How Immigrants Are Changing American Life, and another book titled Replenished Ethnicity, Mexican-Americans, Immigration, and identity. Um, and I won't go through the many journals that he's published in. He's also a public intellectual, um, writing regularly and speaking to NPR, and um, has authored columns in the Washington Post, written on CNN.com, and written for uh, the Los Angeles Times. Um, and he also wanted everyone to know as well that he is the recipient of a um, sportsmanship award in the fourth grade. Um, so with those, um, with his wonderful credentials, let us please welcome uh, Tomas Jimenez. Thank you. <laughs> Way to go. Way to go. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen, for that introduction. I was joking with Kathleen when she said, is there anything you want me to tell them when I introduce you? And I said, well, I won the Sportsmanship Award in the Police Athletic League uh, Santa Clara Youth Soccer in, in 1985. And so I wanted people to know that I won that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I th thanks for being here, and, uh, and thanks for your interest in this topic. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about what I think is perhaps the most important aspect of the so-called immigration debate today, and that is the issue of undocumented, unauthorized immigrants and their fate, and what their fate means for the future of this country. And I want to start off by setting the scene for you a little bit. This is not advancing. Hold on. There we go. So I want to start off by setting the scene for you a little bit. Um, and, and I want to do that by telling you just a little bit in very broad terms about the immigrant population in the United States today. This is a graph that the Migration Policy Institute puts out every year. And it shows the total number of foreign-born individuals living in the United States, and that's the blue line. Um, let's see if I can get the laser pointer. That's the blue line right here. And then it also shows that population as a percent of the total U.S. population, and that's this orange line. And this graph shows all immigrants, regardless of legal status, uh, regardless of country of origin. And what it shows is that we have today more immigrants than we've ever had in this nation's history. However, we're reaching a point that some people might say is normal relative to past periods of history. We are reaching a point where close to 14% of the population is foreign-born. When you combine the foreign-born population with the children of immigrants, about 25% of the population. And I just want to point out that the middle of the 20th century, in some ways, was sort of a weird period. In, in historic terms, and it was a weird period because there were so few immigrants in the United States. Immigrants today, of course, come overwhelmingly from Latin America and from Asia. In previous eras, they came at first overwhelmingly from Northern Europe and then Southern and Eastern Europe. But I want to kind of focus in a little bit on how this population breaks down by legal status. Contrary to popular belief, the overwhelming majority of immigrants in the United States are here with authorization, with some kind of legal status. So if you look at the share of the foreign-born, let me just first say that this is a graph uh, that's put together by the Pew Research Center, dividing the immigrant population into different legal statuses. And almost half of all immigrants in the United States are citizens. Almost half. And then... Um, Another, more than a quarter are lawful permanent residents. These are people who have green cards. And then you have a relatively small sliver that are temporary migrants. These are people who are here on work visas or student visas. And then you have almost a quarter of the population 
that is unauthorized. These are people who either entered the United States without inspection and then stayed, or people who came in with a legal visa, overstayed their visa, and then their status lapsed. But I want, to, I want you to, to take home two things from this slide. The first is that the overwhelming majority of the people who are, were born in another country and who are in the United States are here legally. The second thing I want you to take home is that there is still a substantial share of that foreign-born population that is unauthorized. And it's that population that I want to focus the rest of my comments on. And you've probably heard people talk about this population uh, quite a bit. And talk about this population in terms of a crisis. This is an ad that was aired during the 2018 election about the uh, caravan that was supposedly um, uh, kind of storming the border from the so-called Northern Triangle countries. Uh, the president has talked a lot about um, today's undocumented, unauthorized immigrants in particular being perpetrators of crime, people who uh, are endangering the lives of people in the United States. And he felt so strongly about this uh, that he even opened up an office in U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement dedicated to handling cases of people who have been victims of crime at the hands of unauthorized immigrants. I am not exaggerating when I say that it is unclear what this office actually does. Uh, this is not hyperbole. They, uh, there's, there is very little work for them to do. And there's very little work for them to do. The, the signal on this thing is weak. So I have to keep wandering over here to, there we go. I might as well just press the space bar. Um, and, and they have so little work to do because the fact is that immigrants are way less likely to make, commit crime than, um, than people who were born in the United States. And I want to put this in kind of recent historical context. And I want to lay out a couple of facts. The first is that the United States is about as safe as it's been in any time in the last 100 years. The United States is really, really, really safe. And it got really, really safe in about the last 23, 24 years. And over that time, we also had a massive influx of immigrants. And that's basically what this figure shows right here. This, is, um, this comes from the US Census Bureau, from the American Community Survey, and also from the FBI. And over here on the right pane, it reports the violent crime rate from 1980 to 2016. The violent crime rate has gone down by 36%. Over that time, our immigrant population has more than doubled. Now, I know what you're saying. Correlation is not causation. And you're right. Correlation is not causation. But there's a heck of a lot of correlation here uh, that appears no matter how we slice the data. So this is a graph that uh, the Washington Post Wonk blog published a couple of years ago. And it shows the uh, undocumented population of a sh as a share of a state's population down here um, plotted against the violent crime rate. And each of these dots represents one state in one year and its violent crime rate and the share of the population in that state that's undocumented. There is a clear pattern here which shows that the more undocumented immigrants you have in your state, the lower the crime rate. We can drill down to the city level. And here we're not talking about just unauthorized immigrants, we're talking about all immigrants. Each of these dots represents a city in a particular year, showing the overall crime rate plotted with the size of the foreign-born population. Miami-Dade County has the highest percentage of immigrants of any county in the United States. It also has an amazingly low crime rate. New York City, Gotham, is not Gotham anymore. And one of the reasons it's not Gotham anymore is because it had a massive influx of immigrants in the last few decades. If you talk to the leading experts in the country, the leading criminologists in the country, they'll say that there's lots of reasons why the crime rate dropped so dramatically in the last generation. One of the primary reasons is that we had an influx of really, really law-abiding people, and those people are immigrants. Let's drill down to Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City saw its immigrant population go up 157%. And in the same period of time, assaults went down 12%, robberies down 43%, and murders down 45%.
Again, correlation is not causation, but the correlations are fairly strong. The other thing you've probably heard is that we have a border that is out of control. A border where people are flooding across and there's a need to ramp up border enforcement more than ever. Now bear in mind, and I'm sure others will talk about this this afternoon if we haven't already, bear in mind that we have ramped up border enforcement in the last generation like no other time in American history. With more walls, with more border patrol uh, officials, with ground sensors, with stadium lighting, with unmanned drones, with cameras. Uh, we have a lot of border security, but you've also heard, I'm sure, that there are marauding immigrants who are seeking to come across the border and do us harm. I'm here to tell you that the border has not been more in control in four decades. This, this is the, a graph of the size of the undocumented population in the United States from 1990 to 2017. Starting with the Great Recession, or actually I should say right before the Great Recession, the size of the undocumented population peaked at about 12.2 million individuals. Since that time, the size of the undocumented population has gone down dramatically, dramatically. We stand now with an undocumented population at about 10.5 million. A lot of reasons why the undocumented immigrant population declined. Part of it was there was really no more undocumented immigration, partly because of the Great Recession and partly because of changes that were happening in Mexico, both in terms of its age structure, that is the aging of the population, and also in terms of economic opportunity. And I mention Mexico because Mexico has historically been the largest source country of unauthorized immigration. The other reason the unauthorized population declined was because of mass deportations. You might know that uh, President Obama's administration set a record for the no most deportations of any administration in American history. For a period of about two to three years, they were deporting around 400,000 people. Uh, and then the de deportations declined after that. But suffice to say, the unauthorized population has shrunk. And so have apprehensions at the U.S.-Mexico border. Customs and Border Protection keeps track of how many people they apprehend every year. And this graph shows the number of people apprehended going from 1962 to 2019. And these are estimates from 2019. We still don't have the full figures in. And what it shows is that we had a ton of deportations in the late 90s and in the early 2000s. And then, once again, starting with the Great Recession, there was a plummet in the number of apprehensions. And we reached the lowest number of apprehensions in 2016 since the early 1970s. We had a spike in 2019, and now there's a good reason to think it's going to go back down. I want to emphasize this point. If you draw a straight line from this period, the most recent period, back to the early 1970s, we are apprehending as many people today, roughly speaking, as we did in the early 1970s. Bear in mind that the early 1970s, we had far fewer border patrol. We have around 20,000 border patrol today. So our capacity to, uh, to uh, apprehend people crossing the U.S.-Mexico border is greater than ever, and we're catching fewer and fewer people. This is the best indicator we have of how little traffic there is across the U.S.-Mexico border. And I mentioned a second ago that Mexico has become um, is, is now a minority source country of undocumented immigration. If you look at who's getting apprehended coming across the U.S.-Mexico border, it is now Central Americans much more than Mexicans. When I was a brand new assistant professor at UC San Diego, I took a tour of the, with the Border Patrol. And the Border Patrol have a, had a terminology of people who crossed, and there was a category called OTM, other than Mexican. And what the Border Patrol told us, and, the, and the, their own stats bear this out, is for every nine Mexican people they caught, they caught one non-OTM, other than Mexican. Today, uh, Mexicans are the minority, and in fact, it's OTMs that constitute the majority. But even with the spike in asylum seekers, these are mostly asylum seekers from Central America, we're nowhere near the 1.6 million apprehensions that we were at its peak. So two things I want you to know. This is kind of a reactive addressing of some of the immigration debate as it relates to unauthorized immigration. One is that we have 
uh, lower crime rates in part because we have so many immigrants in the United States. And the second thing is that the border is actually as secure as it's been in 50 years. So I want to kind of put that in the back of your mind and I want to make the case for legalization. The fact is we have a, we've had a decline in the number of unauthorized immigrants in the United States, but we still have a lot of unauthorized immigrants. And their lives are dramatically shaped by the fact that they lack legal status. But it's not just their lives that are impacted, it's the lives of every future generation that descends from those immigrants. And moreover, I want to make the argument that the rest of us, the rest of us who are not undocumented are affected by the fact that we have so many people who are undocumented in the United States and not affected in the way that you've heard, not because we're victims of crime, but because we're victims of a system that doesn't allow people to realize their full potential. So let me tell you what is legalization first. We actually have no legalization system in place right now. We have a semblance of a legalization, a sort of quasi-legalization program called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. In 2012, President Obama signed an executive order that gave certain individuals, people who were brought here as children, reprieve from deportation, it also, protection from deportation. It also gave them the opportunity to get work permits, to get social security numbers, and having a social security number allowed them to get driver's licenses. DACA is still in place. Uh, the Supreme Court will decide on DACA's fate and announces, is deciding on DACA's fate and will likely announce their decision sometime this spring. The kind of legalization that I'm advocating for is something that's much broader. Man, where is the signal? Is something that's much broader. Uh, the legalization that I'm advocating for would legalize most, if not all, but most of the 10.5 million people that are currently unauthorized. And they would have to pass a background check, they would have to pay any back taxes, and then they would have to agree to learn English. And these are sort of the plat, this is a platform of comprehensive immigration reform, which was a approach to immigration reform that was talked about for about two decades, which is no longer talked about. But I think we actually have to go back to something like this. And I want to tell you why. The reason is that a legalization program is a de facto assimilation program. Immigra opinions about immigration in the United States are not driven primarily by economic threat. They're not driven by a sense that people are coming to take our jobs or that immigrants in general are somehow unfairly taking them a system from a system. They're driven by a sense of cultural threat. That's the primary driver. But when you give people an opportunity to maximize their ability to realize their economic potential, that was a mouthful, so if you give them the opportunity to realize their economic potential, the kinds of cultural fears that we often have about immigration tend to dissipate. And I think a legalization program does that. And you get a sense of how that happens uh, by thinking about the kinds of integration that is already happening among unauthorized immigrants. The fact is there's lots of integration happening. And part of the integration that's happening is, is a result of the fact that unauthorized immigrants, on average, have been here for quite a while. This is a graph put out by the Pew Research Center, and it shows the proportion of the unauthorized population that has been here for a decade or more. More than two-thirds of the unauthorized population have been here for a decade or more. And in that decade plus that they've been here, there is some semblance of integration, some semblance of assimilation happening. They own homes, they have children, in most cases if they have children, their children are US born citizens. They have jobs, they pay taxes, they are our friends, they are our neighbors, they are our family members. There's some integration that is happening. But that integration is stalled by the fact that their legal status holds them back. And you get a sense of the way in which their legal status holds them back by comparing what happens when a population is able to legalize and what happens when a population is not able to legalize. Some colleagues of mine at UC Irvine did a study of the Mexican origin population plus a number of other immigrant populations in Los Angeles County. And they focused in particular on the Mexican population. And they looked at the 
educational trajectories of men and women whose immigrant origin ancestor came to the United States undocumented, and then they compared the people whose ancestors were able to legalize and those who weren't, and then followed over the course of generations their educational trajectory. Now I want to pause, and just before I walk you through this, I want to pause to say a little bit about the legalization that many of those people benefited from. And it was a legalization in 1986 called the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And President Reagan signed the largest legalization in this country's history and made the same case that I'm making right now, which is legalization will allow people to come out from under the shadows. I know that's a widely used notion to talk about what legalization does, but to allow them to come out from under the shadows and become full participants in American society. And President Reagan was right. That's exactly what it did. And let me, and, I, and I'm basing that on, on these data and others. So these data compare the, the educational trajectories when uh, someone's grandparent, great-grandparent, or great-great-grandparent was, excuse me, great-grandparent, parent, grandparent, or great-grandparent was able to legalize. And I want you to compare the educational trajectories. We're looking here at number of years of education of, of Mexican origin men who, who's, uh, in this case, their mother, grandmother, uh, excuse me, mo mothers, grandmother, and great-grandmother legalized. And if you look at their educational trajectories, not only do they start higher, they continue to elevate over time such that the average uh, Mexican man whose uh, who's female ancestor is able to legalize uh, has more than a high school degree. Compare that to those who were not able to legalize and the, edu and the average educational attainment for two and a half generations is below a high school degree. The same pattern attains when we um, compare that to women. And, and in fact, for women in Los Angeles County uh, whose immigrant ancestor is able to legalize, the number of years of education they get by the 3.5 generation, that is their, their great grandmother legalized, is 3.7 years, which is exactly the average of white women in LA County. They fully catch up. This right here represents the penalty in perhaps the most important indicator of integration we have, which is education. It represents the penalty for being unauthorized. We don't have anything like the 1986 Immigration and Reform and Control Act, but what we have today is DACA, which is that temporary program. And DACA, for the people who received it, was a boon to their integration. The graph I'm showing you here comes from research done by the political scientist Tom Wong, and he surveyed DACA recipients, asking them how their lives had changed after they received DACA. And what he shows, and I'm going to read this off the screen here too, is that 69% got a job with better pay, 89% got a driver's license, 92% of those who were already in school said that they pursued edu educational opportunities that they previously could not. The average age wage, excuse me, average wage went up by 45%. 57% were able to earn more money, which, which has helped their family. 21% bought a new car. And then there was a proposed program that would have legalized parents called DAPA, um, and that never materialized. Actually, it was, it was held up in courts and blocked by the courts. Suffice to say that the lives of these individuals improved dramatically. Was DACA a cause of that? Some of my colleagues and I at Stanford think so. We compared uh, some health data from Oregon, and we compared the uh, a set of women who were eligible for DACA and women who were ineligible from DACA, and we compared the eligibility just before and just after the birth date cutoff line. So if you were born on before June 15, 1981, you were ineligible for DACA. If you were born after June 15, 1981, you were eligible. This is what social scientists call an opportunity to look at a natural experiment. There's no reason to think that people born a little bit before and a little bit after DACA are any different from each other in any other way except that one is eligible for DACA and one is not. And then we looked at the diagnosis of anxiety and, ju and adjustment disorder, which is a, a kind of mental health uh, affliction for children. And we looked at their US-born children and their rates of adjustment anxiety 
uh, disorder. And what we found is that if your mother was eligible for DACA, your rates of anxiety and adjustment disorder were significantly lower than if your mother was ineligible. This is, for social science, it's very hard to make causal claims about immigration policy. This is about as good as we can do. And it certainly supports the data I showed you on the last slide. So legalization is really effective even when it's minimal, as in the case of DACA. And if you listen to the words of people who have been recipients of DACA, I think you get a fuller picture. As one individual told Time Magazine in 2017, my life totally changed when I see DACA. For one, I was the first undocumented student admitted to the University of Alabama. I still have my acceptance letter because that was something that I had never imagined happening. I graduated from high school in 2010. And when I graduated, I thought I would never be able to go to college. I remember walking across the graduation stage and just thinking to myself, you know, this is it. When I walk off the stage, there's no more opportunities. There's nothing for me. There's nothing whatsoever. I knew that other students felt the same, and I wanted to be able to help them. This is the last section I want to talk about, but, and it's the argument that Americans actually want legalization. And this is where the title of my talk comes into play, which says that we are sort of defying caricatures. There are caricatures in the immigration debate. There are those who are Republican conservatives who want to kick everyone out, and don't want any immigrants here, and then, and I'm, I'm portraying the caricatures, I'm not offering my opinion, and then on the, on the left there are liberals and Democrats who want open borders and just want to let anyone in. That, those people don't really exist in the immigration debate as much as we think they do, and I want to prove that. So there is certainly a partisan divide on views about immigration, including with respect to legalization, but I want to suggest that we're not as divided as we think. I know this seems crazy to say in these times, but I'm making the argument anyway because I look at the data. So this is a, a poll that was fielded by the Pew Research Center that, that, at, that looked at the percentage of people who feel that giving people, uh, giving people who come to the U.S. illegally a way to gain legal status is like rewarding them for doing something wrong or don't think that it's a reward for doing something wrong. The majority of Americans, more than two-thirds, think that it's not a reward for doing something wrong. And Republicans are quite divided, with even a slight majority, uh, excuse me, are almost evenly divided in their thinking. Democrats are not quite as divided. I'm telling you, I've got two minutes. I promised I would speak for 25 minutes. I'm sorry, I'm wrapping up here. Um, <laughs> further defying caricature is... Uh, is um, people's opinions about whether they think that immigration is good or bad for the country. There's a Quinnipiac poll taken in 2019 last summer. 70% of Americans think overall that, uh, that immigrants are good for the country. Half of Republicans think that immigrants are good for the country. Almost 90%, almost 9 in 10 Democrats, and almost three-quarters of independents. And remember that in the, there's a kind of myth of the independents. Independents either lean Republican or lean Democrat, but here we've put them all together. They also favor a legalization program. This is a poll taken by CNN, and let me say that this poll has been, these findings have been repeated over and over and over again. 80% of Americans favor a plan for legal residency. That is the kind of legalization that I'm talking about. 80% of Americans, you can't get 80% of Americans to agree on anything right now, but they agree on this. 80% of Americans also are in favor of DACA. This is a poll that comes from CNN as well. Once again, 80%. You can't get 80% of Americans to agree on anything. And research that I've done with some colleagues in New Mexico and Arizona shows that when people believe that immigration policies are going to become more welcoming, they show more positive social psychological affect, and they feel like they belong more in their state. And this includes not only Latinos in these two states, two states, but the whites. There are partisan differences that I'm going to not talk about in the interest of time, but, the, but whites overall feel like they belong more and have more positive affect if they think immigration policies are going to be more welcoming. And let me just close uh, by, uh, let, me, let me read you one quote from somebody we interviewed that I think really defies characters. This is Linda Jones. So when we interviewed, she's a small business owner in New Mexico. She's an, she's an ardent Trump supporter, uh, voted for him and will vote for him again. But when we asked her about what to do about the unauthorized immigrant population in the United States, she said, I don't want people rounded up. I don't think anybody really does, no matter how they characterize it, even nationally. I don't think it's appropriate to go round people up like that that are here for a certain period of time. 
I'd like to see it done more like if you've been here for a number of years and can show proof of residency and proof you've got a job, you should be able to walk into an office somewhere and sign up for the road to citizenship and get a legal card immediately. Okay, there's a moral imperative. This is honestly the close. There's a moral, there's a moral imperative for, uh, for legalization too. I would argue that the benefits are widespread, that legalization is not an individual benefit, it's a collective good. And it's a collective good because it benefits not only the recipients and their own economic mobility across generations, but it also benefits US-born generations that are the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and it benefits the US economy. Go back to those findings that I showed you related to DACA and how much better off those individuals were economically, that means they're more economic, they're better economic contributors. And then I think there's an argument for legalization if you care about democracy. People who are governed by a set of laws ought to have say in how those laws are made. And if people are going to be residing here for a long time, they ought to be brought into the political fold so that they can live out what we think are some of the core, at least I think are the core principle of democracy, is that, which is that if you live under a set of laws, you ought to have some say. And if you're a pragmatist, if all you care about whether what we, what we can get done, mass deportations, deporting 10.5 million people would be unbelievably disruptive economically, disruptive socially, and disruptive politically. Thanks for listening, and sorry I went over. Uh, thank you, Professor Jimenez, for those remarks. And we can now open it up for uh, Q&A. Uh, we do have some microphones going around, so if you have a question, just please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to arrive. Thank you. Uh, what do you think would be a fair, just, and appropriate uh, immigration policy for the United States? Wow. <laughs> um, well, so I'm, I think you know that I think one of the fair, just, and just policies would be a program that allows people to be put on a, a pathway that could potentially result in, in citizenship. Um, I do think that a country has the right to say who comes in and who doesn't. Uh, I think that, um, and this is based off of kind of principles of democracy, that if you're in a political community, you get to say who's in your political community and, and who's not. And I think that a fair and just immigration policy in the United States has to be based on um, the, the principles that are foundational to our country. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, right now we are, and I'm, I'm somewhat punting on your question, I realize, uh, but right now we are not doing our fair share in being a place where uh, life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness exist in abundance uh, in terms of our refugee policy. Um, so I think a fair and just policy would be actually doing more uh, to, to allow refugees in and do what we've done with our refugee policy uh, over the last more than half century which is to help refugees integrate and help them be contributors to the United States, which is exactly what they've done since we've had a refugee policy. Um, I think we have to have a policy that's based um, partly on the economic needs in the United States, but not exclusively. The immigrants, when they come here, have to have an opportunity to be able to stay if they meet certain criteria, if they meet criteria set forth by the members of the political community who get to have a say in and what those criteria are. To lay out a comprehensive immigration policy at a forum like this uh, is beyond my capacity. Uh, and there's lots of immigration lawyers here in the front row. And, and if you come down after, they will tell you exactly the answer. No, it's extremely difficult. And so I, you know, I don't want to pretend that, it's, it's, uh, that there's an easy answer. And I've kind of given what I think is part of an answer. Um, but I think that no matter where you stand on the issue, you have to recognize that it, the, the complexity of managing migration between two places, or between more than two places, um, it's incredibly difficult. The, the kinds of economic interests, the humanitarian interests, 
uh, the social interests that are involved make it extremely complicated. And so even the most well-meaning administration would have difficult, as has had difficulty coming up with a fair and just immigration policy precisely because it's, it's difficult. So, you know, and I'm, I'm rambling on right now showing just how difficult it is. Now I'm asking for an opinion. Okay. I have a friend whose in-laws live in a Central American country in which they're fairly wealthy and they have to have two armed guards at their doors mm -hmm. 24 hours. Now, what is your, what are your thoughts about America trying to help these countries who are having so much trouble with these gangs and problems that are forcing immigration into the United States? I mean, I, I think we should help. Uh, and we have had policies in place that does seek to make those countries more stable. The Trump administration has pulled that funding um, and, and pulled it to sort of create more, than a, more of a stick and said that we're, we're sort of going to use the pulling of our funding to punish you for not doing more to stabilize and, or have more kind of law and order in your country. Um, I don't know empirically what effect that has had. Um, I would, I would hypothesize that it has not been positive. Um, there has been talk of offering more direct military assistance and beyond sort of funding, but actually having a military presence in those countries, and there's lots of historical reasons to not do that. Uh, that has not gone well in the past. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I think we should do more. I think going back to my earlier response, the way we're recognizing the complexity of the issue, you know, the, the people who are fleeing Central American countries are mostly fleeing violence, but um, under, um, under kind of UN definitions of what, what constitutes a refugee, they are not, un most of them are not under one of the protected categories of uh, which, which would um, which would kind of trigger a designation of refugees. That's that makes part of it. That's part of what makes it complicated. Um, but the the fact is that most people don't want to migrate. They'd rather and most people don't migrate. They'd rather stay where they are. Uh, and so I think to the extent that we can help people, you know, pursue their aspirations where they live, which is what most people want to do, we should. Um, and, you know, but, but that's not happening. The fact is that people are migrating. And, I mean, there are others who have already talked about and are in a better position to talk about the disastrous policy that we've had in terms of our response to um, what is, in historical terms, not that big of a wave of refugees, um, although we treated it as such. Uh, I'll leave it there to take some more questions. <clears throat> Thank you for the great talk and sharing uh, illuminating information with us. Um, I mostly certainly agree with you about the legalization aspect and then it's really great to see the DACA recipients are getting that, you know, all those benefits, you know, like more economic opportunities and all that. Um, what I want to ask you about is actually, I seem, I have noticed that people who support maybe President Trump's stance on strengthening the border or even, you know, putting up a wall and deportating these uh, unauthorized immigrants. They seem to have this notion about immigrants taking their jobs away. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if immigrants get those better economic opportunities, like what happened to native born, you know, Americans, like which I wish I have a better explanation for them that because I think immigrants are taking jobs that they don't want to have, mm -hmm. you know, like difficult jobs. But would you have any maybe data or like, you know, kind of research that you can share with us about that? Sure. So um, there's a debate among economists about whether immigrants uh, take jobs. So in economic terms, are they replacements of U.S. born workers uh, or do they not take their jobs? And in economic terms, are they complements? Um, and the debate is sort of rages. Uh, and basically what economists try to do is show that uh, what happens when a group of immigrants settle in a place, what happens to the wages of U.S.-born workers. So you can think of a, a 
hypothetical U.S. born worker who, let's say, loses their job because an immigrant takes it, there's the possibility that they take another job that is the U.S. born worker and the job pays even better. So that's a kind of complement case. Um, and and the, the worst case scenario uh, is somewhere around 8% uh, decline in the wages of some. It's usually um, high school dropouts, often minority, uh, the population, about an 8% decline in their wages. That's the worst case scenario. And there are economists who question whether that worst case scenario even uh, materializes, depending, depending on how you look at the data. Um, but I mentioned earlier that I think the immigration attitudes are not driven primarily by economic fears. They're driven mostly by cultural fears. And um, immigration is also uh, an issue that tends to be important to people when politicians make it important to people. So if, you, if, if politicians aren't really talking about immigration, and I'm summarizing here political science data, if, if politicians aren't really talking about immigration, and, and you look at, like Gallup asked people what the most important issues are to them, immigration falls way down. People actually don't care that much about it unless people incite them to care a lot about it, which I, I think is what's happening right now. Um, and there's a, there's a solid quarter to a third of the American electorate who has um, pretty restrictionist views about immigration. And, and people haven't really changed their minds lately. If anything, their minds, the, their position on immigration has just become firmer, either much more kind of accommodating in terms of their attitudes about immigrants or much more restrictionist. And in fact, what we've seen on the accommodating side is that that population has actually grown, not only in size, but also in the kind of strength of their feelings. I think the other thing to say is that this also comes from political science research is that People voted for the president for lots of different reasons, and there are lots of people who voted for the president primarily because of immigration, but, but not everyone who voted for him voted primarily because of immigration. And then we'll come down here. I promise to be quicker. Thank you. Oh, maybe. Uh, I may have misunderstood you, but I thought earlier in your talk you said something, made a statement that right now we'd have no process of legalization. But, but I'm, you know, I'm sure you didn't quite mean what I thought that. You, people do get green cards. People do get oh, yes, uh, citizenship. Yes. But could you describe the process right now of how, say, somebody who's been here five years or, or so, moved here for a job, but then decide they want to get residence permit and a job. How does that work? And, but I've also heard reports from immigrants uh, who are trying to do that, of this taking five, 10, 15, 20 years. What percentage of the pro people are going, the applicants are going through that relatively quickly, and how many are taking outrageous amounts of time and money? The short answer to your question is I don't know. Um, the, the, the first part of your question, so, so you're right, you, you, um, you didn't mis, mishear me, but, um, but I didn't mean to apply that, imply that nobody is, be, is moving on to citizenship or green card status. Lots of people are doing that. Lots, otherwise, we wouldn't have a plurality of the immigrant population that are, that are U.S. citizens and, and a majority of the U.S. citizens are green card holders. I, and in fact, there are some people who are undocumented who are becoming legal through various channels. It's kind of complicated how that happens, um, but people who are here on some sort of temporary visa often have an opportunity to apply to have a green card. There's a five-year period that you wait. I'm kind of giving you the prototypical case. There are immigration attorneys in the front row who can, who can frown at me if I'm getting this totally wrong. Um, you, there's a, usually a five-year period that you wait, and then you apply for citizenship. Where I think you are correct, and this comes from people I know who are clinicians, people who work in and do uh, immigration law work, that that process under the Trump administration has slowed down dramatically. Uh, that cases that come through US, um, U.S. citizenship and immigration services are being slowed down partly because the people who process those applications are being given virtually no discretion. And any, so in the past they might have had some discretion to make decisions about cases, and now any question about a case has to go uh, before a judge, has to go before a higher authority to make some determination. Kit, how am I doing? Thank you. Um, what else could you say? Uh, um, so it, is, it has been slowed down quite a bit 
Uh, but there are people who are still becoming legal, and even including among the undocumented, although it's not a big population. Wait for the microphone. Thank you for the talk. Um, could you speak more up about the agree to learn English as one of the proposed um, um, requirement yeah. for uh, your notion of larger legalization, mm -hmm. especially for it to be one, to be deliberately laid out there as one of the requirement? Thank yeah, you. so this is, um, this, I put that up there for two, maybe three reasons. One, it's because when there has been some legalization legislation on the table, that was one of the components. And it was one of the components, I think, partly to address the cultural, partly for political reasons, because there are people who worry about the cultural aspect of legalizing people, that those people aren't going to become part of our culture. In the United States, nothing constitutes the nucleus of American culture more than speaking English. Uh, and in fact, my, my colleagues who study English language acquisition say the United States remains a graveyard for non-English languages, much to the chagrin of immigrant parents, including mine. Um, and so, uh, two minutes, okay. Um, so part of it is for political reasons. And then the other component of it, I think, is because it actually carves out a space to put resources behind helping people learn English. So beyond the kind of addressing political fears, speaking English, is associated with, uh, with higher earnings. It's associated with parents being more involved in their schools. There's nothing in here, and in fact, Americans, if you look at um, polling data, wouldn't, wouldn't say that people should forget the language that they brought with them or their parents or their grandparents brought with them, but that English is, is important. And so it's, it's a, and in fact, if you, if you look at polling data about immigrants, about 90% of immigrants say in order to be American, one needs to speak English. So it's kind of, that's another area where everyone agrees it's really important. So I put it in there for pol policy reasons, political reasons, and also because I think it reflects um, a, a, a proposal that needs to be revived. Great. Um, please join me in uh, again thanking Professor Thomas Thank you. for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, we have a 10 minutes before our next talk at 1.30, or 1.30. Um, and so you can go out and use the bathroom if you need to, but please be back here in time for our, uh, the start of our next talk at 1.30. Thank you.
If you could take your seats, we're going to get started. My name is Katie Shoemaker, and I teach in the Constitutional Studies program here, and I'm here to introduce Professor Alan Kraut. Alan M. Kraut is Distinguished Professor of History at American University and a fi um, fellow of the Migration Policy Institute, specializing in immigration, ethnic history, and the history of medicine in the United States. He is the author or editor of nine books and many scholarly articles, too numerous to name. These volumes include The Huddled Masses, The Immigrant in American Society, 1880 to 1921, Silent Travelers, Germs, Genes, and the Immigrant Menace, Goldberger's War, The Life and Work of a Public Health Crusader, the co-authored volume Covenant of Care, Newark Beth Israel and the Jewish Hospital in America, and most recently, Ethnic Historians in the Mainstream, Shaping America's Immigration Story. He is currently writing a history of xenophobia and nativism throughout American history. Among the awards his publications have received are the Immigration and Ethnic History Society's Theodore Saludos Prize, the Society for History in the Federal Government's Henry Adams Prize, the American Public Health Association's Arthur Basiltier Prize, and the New Jersey Studies Academic Alliance's Authors Award. Professors Kraut uh, Professor Kraut's research has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Smithsonian Institution, and the National Institutes of Health. He is a past president of the Organization of American Historians and serves as current president of the National Coalition for History. He's also an elected fellow of the Society of American Historians. In 2017, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Immigration and Ethnic History Society. Please welcome Alan Kraut. Thank you, Katie. It's truly a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I want to especially thank Dean David Robel and Professor Justin Ward for issuing the invitation that brought me here this afternoon, uh, as well as Miss Helen Green. I think my colleague Katie Benton Cohen was quite right. We all need a Helen Green to organize uh, our lives and events. And of course, to Katie Schumacher for the lovely introduction. I have never been to Oklahoma before, but as a kid from the Bronx who grew up in the 1950s, walking distance to Yankee Stadium, I feel very close and a very close bond. Mickey Mantle of Commerce, Oklahoma was my idol. I only became a historian because I lacked the talent to play center field for the Yankees. And when Mantle died in 1995, the comedian Billy Crystal confessed that he had practiced his bar mitzvah speech in an Oklahoma twang out of respect for the Mick. I can only tell you that Billy Crystal was not alone. Those of us who watched Mantle on those Bronx Sunday afternoons were told that big, strong guys like the Mick was what American and Americans were really about. One of the perennial challenges posed by immigration to the United States has been the suspicion of those already here that newcomers will not or cannot integrate themselves into American society and culture. In my recent work on nativism in American history, I've concluded that fear of the foreign born as a subversive influence is a constant, a thread that runs through the fabric of American life in every period of our history. At times, that fear is blazing hot in its intensity. At other times, it is on low burner, but never is it completely extinguished? Certainly nativism has been an American theme prominent in the 21st century. Prior to the presidential election of 2016, then candidate Donald Trump characterized undocumented migrants from Mexico as rapists and prostitutes. Following his election, his appointees in the White House, such as Stephen Bannon, and then later Stephen Miller, 
offered equally uncomplimentary portraits of those wishing to cross our border as immigrant or refugee. White supremacists and neo-Nazis joined the Unite the Right demonstration in Charlottesville, taking the message of unwelcome into the streets, carrying burning torches, semi-automatic rifles, and banners referencing Nazi and Nordic mythology, while shouting racist, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and anti-Semitic chants. Even respected intellectuals and academics have proven susceptible to nativist anxieties. The late Samuel P. Huntington of Harvard University, a distinguished political scientist, surprised many in 2004 by expressing his fear that America's newest arrivals could not or would not accept what he regarded as the legacy of the earliest British settlers, including Protestant values, the English language, individualism, religiosity, and respect for written law. He was especially perturbed by the robust Mexican migration to the United States, legal as well as unauthorized. He claimed there was, quote, a weak identification with America on the part of Mexican immigrants and peoples of Mexican origins. He believed that curbing Mexican immigration entailed many benefits. Not only would the wages of low-income Americans improve, but there would be cultural advantages as well. He wrote, quote, debates over the use of Spanish and whether English should be made the official language of state and national governments would fade away. Bilingual education and the controversies it spawns would decline. The possibility of a de facto split between predominantly Spanish-speaking America and English-speaking America would disappear, and with it, a major potential threat to the cultural and perhaps political integrity of the United States. All of that from curbing Mexican migration, in his view. The concern as to who will fit in and who will not, I would suggest to you this afternoon is old wine in new bottles. And today I want to offer you some perspective on the present apprehension about integrating newcomers into American society by exploring the claims of prominent and powerful nativists at an earlier peak period of immigration, the turn of the 20th century. On October 12th, 1915, Former President Theodore Roosevelt mounted the stage at New York's Carnegie Hall to address the Knights of Columbus, a Catholic fraternal organization. Catholics had long been the target of American nativism. In the antebellum era, Irish Catholics were the target of Protestant mobs, which burned convents, like the Charlestown Convent in Massachusetts. Um, Irish Catholics uh, were the target of the Know Nothing Party, a small political faction that ran candidates very successfully in some states in the years prior to the Civil War, and eventually merged themselves into the modern Republican Party, which was founded in the middle 1850s. Um, when they joined the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln was very quick to denounce them. He wrote to his friend Joshua Speed, I am not a know-nothing, that is certain. How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? When the know-nothings get control, our Declaration of Independence will read, all men are created equal, except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. And when it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy." End quote. Well, immigrants responded to all of this with a saying that lasted throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century. America beckons, but Americans repel. Yes, Americans need immigrants to settle the land, to work in industry, to go deep into the mines, to do the jobs that native-born Americans wouldn't do. But when they arrived, when they responded to the courting gestures, they often felt 
that they were repelled, that they were not welcome in this land. Now, when TR was addressing the Knights of Columbus, Italian and Polish Catholics were the main nativist targets, not as much the Irish. TR coined a phrase that would long outlive him when he assured the Knights of Columbus audience that, quote, what is true of creed is no less true of nationality. There is no room in this country for hyphenated Americanism. While not all naturalized immigrants were hyphenated Americans in TR's eyes, he did insist that, quote, a hyphenated American is not an American at all. He said, Americanism is a matter of the spirit and of the soul. Our allegiance must be purely to the United States. We must unsparingly condemn any man who holds any other allegiance. But if he is heartily and singly loyal to this republic, then no matter where he was born, he is just as good an American as anyone else." End quote. So Roosevelt was critical of those who discriminated against the foreign born simply because of where they had been born. He told the Carnegie Hall crowd, any discrimination against aliens is a wrong, for it tends to put the immigrant at a disadvantage and to cause him to feel bitterness and resentment during the very years when he should be preparing himself for American citizenship. If an immigrant is not fit to become a citizen, he should not be allowed to come here. If he is fit, he should be given all the rights to earn his own livelihood and to better himself that any man can possibly have. Whatever Roosevelt's concerns about hyphenated Americans, this is the term that he coined, he was convinced that newcomers desiring to do so could be fully assimilated into American life. Not all those witnessing the mass migration which brought 23 and a half newcomers to the United States between the 1880s and the 1920s shared Roosevelt's optimism. Some of them passed the Chinese exclusion law of 1882 or participated in anti-Chinese violence like the terrible uh, persecution of the Chinese uh, in uh, Rock Springs, Wyoming, which this uh, cartoon depicts. One who did not agree with TR was his close friend and prolific xenophobe, Madison Grant. The wealthy Grant was an attorney, a world traveler, a conservationist, a founder of the New York Zoological Society, trustee of the American Museum of Natural History, and with Teddy Roosevelt, an architect of the National Park System. Grant was born seven months after the end of the Civil War on November 19, 1865. His father was descended from the first Puritan settlers in New England, while his mother was of French Huguenot stock. Madison's youth was spent largely at a country estate on Long Island, built by his maternal grandfather. Private schools and long vacations abroad were followed by a distinguished academic career at Yale and a law degree from Columbia University. He practiced law, but had strong avocational interests, especially in all things related to nature. And he and Teddy Roosevelt worked for conservation and to preserve and further the sport of big game hunting, preventing the depletion of the deer population through regulation. Regulation. When it came to humanity, Grant also favored regulation. In 1916, Madison Grant published The Passing of the Great Race, which reflected his understanding of an existing natural order or a hierarchy. Observing the flow of immigration into the United States, Grant feared that the racial stock arriving from Southern and Eastern Europe was vastly inferior to that which had arrived from Northern and Western Europe. He feared the mixing of the races would be catastrophic for the future of the United States. In Grant's terminology, the superior stock was the Nordic race, a construct he created by which he meant a loosely defined group 
having both distinctive biological and cultural characteristics. The group emerged from Scandinavia, and Grant credited it with all the favorable traits associated with the American pioneering breed. He identified the Alpine race as those from Central Europe, inferior to the Nordic race, but still far superior to the Mediterranean race from areas ringing the Mediterranean Sea. Committed to the young science of eugenics that you've heard about earlier today, popular with intellectuals on both sides of the Atlantic, Grant supported planned breeding, planned breeding, even as he advocated planned regulation of animal populations and conservation of plants and trees. That's the intellectual connection. Inferior traits must never be permitted to enter the Nordic gene pool. Proposed practical techniques, quarantine, separation, planned breeding, would in his eyes eliminate the undesirable traits and provide for greater procreation among those with desirable traits to sustain the Nordic type in the human gene pool. There was very little doubt in Grant's mind that in addition to regulating human reproduction with eugenics goals in mind, public policy would be necessary to limit the arrival of the unfit via migration. And from 1922 to his death in 1937, Grant was a vice president of an organization committed to these policies, the Immigration Restriction League. He enthusiastically supported in word and deed the data collection required to structure the national origins quota system, made permanent in the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924 uh, that Katie Benton Cohen mentioned this morning. Grant was also actively supporting laws that forbade miscegenation, mixed marriage, such as the State of Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924. He argued that every available legal instrument must be, must be marshaled to preserve the integrity of America's pioneering breed. As did many nativists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Grant made the case that full assimilation by non-Nordics was not only undesirable, but impossible. Any advantages gained in the immediate environment by assisting or educating could not possibly offset the influence of heredity. Heredity, not environment, was primary. And so for Grant, as for um, many other nativists of his era, the Jew, the Eastern European Jew, was the perfect target, the perfect example of environment being unable to trump deficiencies acquired at birth. In the passing of the great race, Grant wrote that just as a Syrian or just as an Egyptian freedman could not possibly be transformed into a Roman by wearing a toga and applauding his favorite gladiator in the amphitheater, so too it would be impossible to transform uh, the Polish Jew, whose dwarf stature, peculiar mentality, and ruthless concentration on self-interest are being grafted upon the stock of the nation. This is what he said would be impossible. Grant regarded Jewish blood as a dominating contaminant, and thus the cross between a Nordic, an Alpine, or even a Mediterranean and a Jew would always produce a Jew. Sounds very, very much like uh, the drop laws of the American South with respect to the African-American population. Now, Lothrop Stoddard, Theodore Lothrop Stoddard, was Grant's protege. Uh, his background was very similar to Grant's. He graduated from Harvard in 1905. And like Grant, he studied law. He attended Boston University, but he didn't earn a degree. He left in 1908, and instead he earned a PhD in history from Harvard in 1914. He shared with Madison Grant an absolute fixation on the relationship of race to the development of civilization. Accepting Grant's racial trinity of Nordic, Alpine, and Mediterranean, Stoddard viewed Jews as Asiatics. Their presence in the immigration stream threatened the racial supremacy of Nordics. Stoddard's opposition to immigration 
was part of a reflection of his own desire to exert social control by limiting the number of poor who might revolt if pressed too hard in their competition for society's resources. Birth control, as yet still scandalous to some, was one way of forestalling what Stoddard regarded as a threatening explosion in the population of the underclass, a thesis that he explored in his uh, 1922 volume, The Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the Underman. Another essential protection would be immigration restriction. Stoddard applauded the immigration restrictions of the 1920s. He enthusiastically embraced all efforts to sustain the majority of individuals of northern European origins in the American population. In another book he published in the 1920s, The Rising Tide of the Threat Against White World Supremacy, Stoddard observed that the Industrial Revolution had made it difficult for the Nordic race to prosper and perpetuate itself because, quote, the cramped factory and crowded city weeded out the big blonde Nordic with portentous rapidity, whereas the little brunette Mediterranean, in particular, adapted himself to the operative's bench or the clerk's stool, prospered and reproduced his kind. Stoddard regarded human migration as a, a handicap for all of civilization's advancement. There can be, I think, little question that Stoddard's theories and terminology resonated with many of the Nazis who rose to power in Germany after 1933. The term Stoddard used in the subtitle of his 1920 volume, Underman, was redeployed by Nazi chief theorist Alfred Rosenberg, who called those deemed racially inferior in the Third Reich Untermenschen. Stoddard actually visited Nazi Germany as a journalist between 1939 and 1940. He was treated with tremendous deference and respect by Nazi officials. And during his visit, Stoddard was even permitted to observe the hereditary health court in Charlottenburg. It was an appeals court established to hear cases of those wishing to elude forced sterilization consistent with the nation's eugenics laws. In his published memoir of the visit, Stoddard expressed his view that the courts were at times too hesitant to insist on sterilization. They should do it more often. He applauded the laws that seemed to him successful in weeding out the worst strains in the Germanic stock in a scientific and a truly humanitarian way. He felt that sterilization was humanitarian. No friend of Jewish immigration to the United States, Stoddard described his surprise that the Germans were so candid in expressing their hatred for the Jews. He was convinced that the Germans would find a solution to the Jewish problem, uh, but he thought that the answer might lay in expulsion. Not even Stoddard envisioned that there would be mass extermination and that the final solution to the Jewish question in Europe would be the use of Zyklon B gas. The real puzzle here is that many nativists also identified as progressives. Adherence to the political philosophy that rational advancement in science and technology, social organization and economic development and government are crucial to improving the human condition. Highly educated men and women committed to such principles might be expected to abhor bigotry and discrimination. However, many progressives found in nativism the salvation of a country that seemed to be threatened, mortally menaced in fact, by industrialization, urbanization, and immigration. Immigrants from non-democratic societies seem to threaten to dump upon America's shores rivals ill-suited to preserving freedom and democratic government. Moreover, their perceived biological inferiority made many Eastern Europeans and Southern Italians and Russian Jews unlikely to incorporate themselves 
into an American population whose roots were in Western Europe. Arguments like those presented by Grant and Stoddard were crucial in passing the highly restrictive Johnson-Reed Act of 1924 that we've mentioned. Uh, this is Albert Johnson uh, from Washington and his colleague David Reed from Pennsylvania. Um, Two percent of the group's population already in the United States, according to the 1890 census, would be the number of people admitted annually from that group. Uh, Katie Benton Cohen mentioned this this morning. This was a, a kind of percentage operation, a way of limiting the newcomers who are arriving in ever greater number, <coughs> excuse me, from Southern and Eastern Europe. Southern Italians, Eastern European Jews, Poles, Russians, and so on. It was, of course, Calvin Coolidge who signed that legislation <clears throat> and who commented when he did that he regarded this as a humane approach to the regulation of the American population. The law was not revised until 1965, and then Philip Hart of Michigan and the much beloved Emanuel Seller of Brooklyn, New York, revised the 1965 law in such a way that it limited, eliminated the national origins quota system, substituted hemispheric quotas, and allowed much more readily from pe people to arrive from parts of the world uh, that had been limited before, parts of Asia, parts of uh, Latin America, and so on. Today, uh, this law, by the way, was uh, signed by Lyndon Johnson, who was standing on Liberty Island at the time in 1965. Today, the current administration seeks to dramatically reduce the number of arrivals using the likely to become a public charge provision of the law to pursue an overall reduction in annual immigration admissions. Economic uncertainties, especially uh, the incomplete and uneven recovery from the 2008 recession has only served to nourish the fear of the foreign-born for both economic and cultural reasons. Fear of the unfamiliar is hardly new. Commenting on the power of fear throughout history, British philosopher Bertrand Russell once observed, quote, collective fear stimulates herd instinct and tends to produce ferocity toward those who are not regarded as members of the herd. Today, a well-educated American elite, descended from earlier waves of newcomers, is part of a larger global elite that reaches across boundaries and borders to help the world's dispossessed, including new arrivals in the United States. Unfortunately, this is often done or perceived to be done at the expense of a domestic rank and file that feels victimized and displaced by those they regard as other. For those feeling displaced and diminished, fighting City Hall to assert their claims seems problematic because all too often the agenda is being set by global interests based in one region of the country or abroad. Economic concerns are not confined by national borders. The end result is a backlash by groups across the globe that seem to resemble one another in their xenophobic extremism. And yet the context in the United States is actually quite different. Compared with other countries, the U.S. is still a young nation built on tides of immigration that are fresh in the public mind. Our arguments over immigration restriction take as a given that immigration is a constant in American life, for the most part. We argue over how many immigrants to admit, not over whether we should be admitting immigrants at all. Today, the United States is not alone in seeking to narrow passage across its borders. Right-wing groups in France, Germany, and the Netherlands are not constrained by the same heritage of opening the door to mass migration, even in the worst of times. The genius of American life to date has been the majority's ability to reconcile our fears with our belief 
even those not of the herd by birth, can still join it through the force of will and effort. Newcomers can negotiate their membership in American society, even in times of increased nativism. Those sentiments were perhaps best captured in the words of Edward Kennedy in the introduction to a volume authored by his brother, John F. Kennedy, the first and so far only Roman Catholic president, a possibility that seemed remote when Teddy Roosevelt addressed the Knights of Columbus. Senator Kennedy reminded his readers, quote, immigration is in our blood. It's part of our founding story. In 2008, he observed that as in the past, immigrants today come from all corners of the world, representing every race and creed. They work hard, they practice their faith, they love their families, and they love this country. We would not be a great nation without them. But whether we remain true to that history and heritage is a major challenge, a major challenge. A dozen years later, mass immigration policy reform remains high on the country's 21st agenda list. The separating of migrant children from their parents and put in separate facilities is, we hope, a vile aberration. It has not been a time-honored policy. What happens next in the decades to come depends very much on how vigilant the American majority remains against the nativist vigilantes that exist in our time as they have all too often in the American past. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for questions. If you have a question, if you could raise your hand and I will direct a microphone wielding undergraduate your way. All right, in the back there. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I, my question is a little bit about terminology. So um, I noticed you were using the term nativist a lot and I assume that that's maybe for historical reasons. Um, but I wonder um, what was your thinking behind choosing that word and why you wouldn't use something like uh, white supremacist or how you would reconcile that with um, other dialogues that are happening around um, Native American claims and um, yeah, so just a really a question about that terminology and why you chose it and how you might um, change it to accommodate some other discourses about Native American identity. Yeah, I use the term nativist occasionally interchangeably with xenophobe, uh, but I like the term nativist because it embodies the concept of a kind of ultra-nationalism or if you will the herd instinct that Bertrand Russell was talking about. Uh, an earlier historian, John Hyam, who wrote a book called Strangers in the Land, said that there were three genres of nativism, anti-Catholicism, anti racial nativism, and anti-radical nativism. And later in his career, he added to that anti-Semitism, which he felt was a separate and distinct genre of, of bias based in this kind of hyper-nationalism. And I, too, think that there's a kind of hyper-nationalism afoot here, which causes us to want to exclude those who are not born to the nation, who are not of the herd. And that's why I use the term nativism so often. Could you tell me, please, if Grant or Stoddard, as I'm not certain of the dates, were part of the eugenics movement in the United States, which some historians say taught Hitler about doing the Holocaust? There's no question that both Grant and Stoddard were supportive of the eugenics movement. They definitely were. Um, at Nuremberg, several of the Nazi defendants uh, argued that a, a lot of what they had learned about eugenics and eugenics concepts came from American thinkers. And it's very true that during this period, 
there was a lot of cross-pollinization back and forth between the United States and Germany. It's coming. <laughs> first, uh, thank you for coming all the way to Oklahoma for the first time. Um, I just wanted to clarify what I think might have been uh, implicit in the previous question about the term nativism. I think people who, who haven't studied the history of political parties and, and anti-immigrant hysteria and ideology don't know or, or haven't heard that the term nativist is a historical term that meant, as Native American meant, not the peoples that we know today were indigenous to these parts, particularly places like I had nothing like to do with that. Yeah. Oklahoma. I understand that. I just wanted to clarify for people who ask the question, if they hear nativism for the first time in history courses, for example, they don't understand that that term has been used with a capital N since the 1840s or earlier um, to refer to anti-immigrant sentiment in favor of people who were born, who were in, in the nation, as you put it, meaning for them, uh, often a Nordic or uh, you know racially identified nation that did not include the peoples that we think of and recognize, sometimes with the term native, though that's a pretty historically new usage, uh, other times with the word indigenous. And I just wanted to clarify that because I know my students um, you know, need some time to uh, absorb that. And particularly, I think, in a place like Oklahoma where uh, you know, it's used to be called Indian country, and now native means uh, something else, and it's often, often fighting words. Thank you again. Yeah, I'm going to try again. <laughs> so uh, thanks for that clarification. So I think uh, what I really wanted to ask and what I would like to hear you elaborate on is if uh, you have considered like native thoughts informing your analysis of this historical um, progression that you're talking about um, in this time period. And if you were to do that, um, what that might look like, like specifically focusing and centering Native Americans and thinking about your presentation. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of the thinking of uh, people like TR and uh, Madison Grant uh, was that Native Americans represented to them a sort of man in nature, uncivilized, uncouth, uh, definitely in need of civilizing, but at the same time having a certain beauty. Uh, because they were closer to nature. And you see this in some of the exhibits that were mounted at the Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, they often referred to them as noble savages. Well, savage is not exactly a nice word to use about anybody, uh, but the nobility part came from what they thought they observed in patterns of warfare, uh, in uh, family relationships, in religiosity, and so on. So they, uh, they liked the Native Americans on a certain level. They didn't regard them as the equivalent of Nordics uh, or the other groups, the Alpines, uh, but they certainly saw them as not unworthy of some praise. But defy, uh, without question, people of an inferior order. Hello. Um, do you see any com uh, comparisons between um, the spread of far-right ideology between the United States and Europe uh, at the turn of the early 20th century compared to some of the stuff going on now? 
uh, some white nationalist individuals like Steve Bannon are trying to set up like far right training centers in Eastern Europe, trying to spread this ideology. So would you say that it is a kind of a comparable spread of this ideology along right wing terms? Yeah, as I do my work is I began begin to take a look at what stuff does Steve Bannon read? Uh, what websites does Stephen Miller look at? Uh, who else, um, on what programs are they serving as speakers and so on? And I'm very struck by the fact that uh, Bannon in particular is steeping himself in a lot of the novels and philosophical treaties that come out of extreme right-wing European thought right now. And for me, it's not unlike this transatlantic uh, dialogue over race, religion, ethnicity, uh, and limiting migration that occurred at an earlier period. In both cases, uh, there's a sense uh, on their part that uh, white civilization is being overrun. There's an extreme racism uh, that's a, sort of a shared body of thought among these thinkers. Uh, and that, too, strikes me a lot like the early part of the 20th century. Time for one more question, if there's any lines down here. There's one right here. Maybe right over here. I'm Helen Duchon. Um, while you were talking, I got to thinking about Leonardo da Vinci. That's a it, nice thought to have. I yeah. <laughs> but uh, he was born of a servant girl, a bastard, if you will. So how would we discover Leonardo da Vinci's in our newcomers? Well, I think as, as earlier speakers have said this afternoon um, and this morning, we have physicians and scientists and novelists among the newcomers who are arriving in the United States and engineers and people who will create the next generation of vaccines. Um, and we are fools if we keep them out of the United States or we prevent them from having a normal transition from foreign-born to citizen. Uh, the loss will be ours, not just theirs. And uh, so I think your point is very well taken. We want the new Leonardos. We want the new scientists. I always think about uh, people like Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin and the polio vaccine and what it would have meant to society had their parents been kept out of the United States by some of the nativist uh, efforts and uh, legislation that was being imposed. What would that loss mean? It would be incalculable. And so I think uh, we have always been nourished and improved as a nation of nations, a nation of immigrants. Uh, why quit a good thing? And I've been very struck as I travel around the country and give talks that um, when I come across uh, associations of business people who I often think are going to uh, be very, very anti-immigration, very conservative in their political views, and quite the opposite. <clears throat> They're yearning for new engineers, new ideas. I mean, the number of patents alone that have been created by the foreign-born uh, in the United States since the Second World War is astronomical. Uh, think about what a loss that would be to the country had they been kept out of the, the society and marginalized in our society. So I think uh, the point that uh, Tomas made before and we've been hearing all day about how essential it is to welcome, to keep the doors open, to embrace, and to provide clear paths to uh, legalization and citizenship and so on, uh, very, very important. Uh, one of the people I work with at the Migration Policy Institute is Doris Meisner, who is the commissioner of INS under Bill Clinton. 
And in the last years of the Clinton administration, Doris and others pushed very, very hard to encourage the uh, new arrivals to embrace citizenship. And a number of people have said that when we give diplomas to our foreign-born students, we ought to have inside the diploma envelope a green card for them uh, so that we benefit from the kind of educational opportunities we've provided. This is something we have embraced in the past to our advantage um, and that we need to embrace right now more than ever. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Kraut. We now have time for a brief break. Next session begins at 2.30, so I'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Thanks for all your help today. Oh, you're welcome. We really appreciate it.
Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, I just want to let you know that members of our amazing Crimson Club, uh, they're wearing the jackets. They're, they're going around uh, with cards. If you'd like to write down a question that we could then put before the panel uh, for the final panel. We've got one more lecture, uh, and then we've got a final panel to wrap up. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to write that down uh, on one of these cards. Thanks. We'll be starting up again in about five minutes. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's, let's get started up again. 
It's just so wonderful to have the teaching back. I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, our members of the audience for coming. I know some of you have traveled a long way at lunch. I met with some folks who'd uh, come from Dallas to the teaching. We're grateful to everybody for their attendance. We've got people from uh, high schools. We've got people from our OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, faculty, students. Uh, it's just uh, lovely to have the teaching back. And uh, something quite remarkable has happened. We've had uh, a set of academic presentations, and everything in the program is still on time. So, big thank you to our speakers. Uh, my job now is to introduce Patty Limerick. Patty uh, is the faculty director of the Center of the American West at the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, where she's a professor of history. Uh, she has dedicated her life and her career to bridging the gap between academics and the general public, to bringing us together and to demonstrating the benefits of, of applying historical perspective to contemporary dilemmas and conflicts. Turning hindsight into foresight is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the monikers of the center of the American West. In January 2016, Governor, Governor Hinkenlooper named Patty Limerick as the Colorado State Historian, a position she served in until 2018 in addition, in January 2016, she was appointed to the National Endowment for the Humanities Advisory Board, the National Council on the Humanities. She's best known, uh, perhaps, in terms of publications for her landmark work, The Legacy of Conquest, an overview and reinterpretation of Western American history that has stirred a huge amount of debate both within the academy and uh, within larger public audiences. She's also a prolific essayist. Many of her most notable articles were gathered uh, together, including uh, the article Dancing with Professors, The Trouble with Academic Prose, were collected uh, in the wonderful 2000 uh, 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 volume, Something in the Soil. She's received a number of awards and honors recognizing the impact of her scholarship and her commitment to teaching, including uh, the uh, MacArthur Fellowship, which she held from 1995 to 2000, and the Hazel Barnes Prize, the uh, University of Colorado's highest award for teaching and research. She's also completed two terms as a Pulitzer nonfiction jurist and also chaired the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, uh, Pulitzer Jury in uh, history. She served as president of the Organization of American Historians, the American Studies Association, the Western History Association, and the Society of American Historians, and also as the vice president of the teaching division of the American Historical Association. Uh, it's a, been a, a remarkable career, and most importantly, from my perspective, 21 years ago, while kindly hosting me as a visiting scholar at the center of the American West, she took me to a Humanities Center event where I met Janet Ward, the founding director of the OU Humanities Forum, a professor of history here at OU, and also my wife. So thank you, Patty, for the work you've done over the course of a career to bring people together. We just hugged each other, and there are terrifying stories of viruses, and we just hug each other in front of the public. Uh, boy, we are brave. Well, David is really brave, and I'm so grateful to him uh, and Justin Wirt and Helen Green for bringing me here today. This is my second visit to a teach-in, which is kind of an unusual thing. There are things that are hard to put in your resume, but they mean a lot, like only one of two or three people to come twice to teach in, having introduced David and Janet. I can't put that on my resume, but what could be uh, more of a source of satisfaction? So I shall start with a story that has a little bit of bearing. When I was in graduate school, a uh, person who I admired very much, Kai Erickson, a sociologist, told us a story, and it drove some of the graduate students wild and enraged them, and it, it pleased me, I guess. So this is a story about a marriage counselor and the marriage counselor is uh, a medical student, is, a, is watching the marriage counselor to observe his technique. So the 
uh, marriage counselor brings in, he says, will you sit over here to the, marriage, to the medical student, brings in the husband, and the husband, he says, tell me the story here. The husband tells him a story about the marriage going downhill, and it is all the wife's fault. Everything is the uh, flaws of the wife. So the marriage counselor says, listens very closely, and he says, I think you're absolutely right. He takes the husband out, brings the wife in, asks her for her story. She tells exactly opposite story, and absolutely everything is the fault of the husband and all of his flaws. So marriage counselor listens very closely, and he says, you know, I think you're absolutely right. So he takes the wife out, and then he turns, comes back in, turns to the medical student, and says, what do you think of my technique? What do you think of my technique? And the me medical student says, well, I, I have to be honest. That was a disaster. You took a bad situation. You made it worse. You validated two conflicting stories. I don't know what you could have done that could have made the situation worse. The marriage counselor listened closely and he said, you know, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> so, so that is a little bit of a character flaw of mine, that I do listen closely to people's <laughs> stories and I am, uh, find them very moving and persuasive and then things fall apart from there. So today's subject I think requires more than the marriage counselor's technique so I will be more than I would ordinarily do, uh, taking a, not exactly a position, but forcefully putting into discussion, I hope, some perspective, historical perspectives that I think would improve our nation's deliberations on immigration. We certainly have had much of that already uh, and wonderfully presented by our, by our earlier speakers. I should tell you, and this is a little bit of a welcome to my world here, I am the very fortunate recipient. My Center of the American West has a very sizable grant from the Mellon Foundation to engage young historians in what we call applied history, bringing historical perspective to bear on the dilemmas and conflicts of our time. So that's what you're going to see at work here, is what applied historians can do. Applied historians can identify patterns in the past, and I will try that with two or three, with three items today. And it is also incumbent on the applied historian to note the uncertainty that is unavoidable when we try to characterize and summar summarize patterns from the past. We also have to be the first to point out that historians are dreadful performers when it comes to prophecy and prediction. We cannot project patterns we observe in the past into the future. But what we can do is reflect on those patterns and we can draw from them something quite useful for the present, a range of inspirational tales, cautionary tales, and tales that are hybrid, that are both inspirational and cautionary. I should say that my own uh, political identity has become quite muddled. And I want to say very directly that I do not see uh, a viable position in open borders with no constraint on movement. That does not seem persuasive or conv convincing to me. I am very taken, it's wonderful how sometimes a writer, Jason DeParle from the New York Times just a couple of days ago wrote this very brief, succinct statement and I agree with this. Immigration poses a moral dilemma. There are more potential migrants than the country can accept. With nearly two billion people living on less than $3.20 a day worldwide, it's impossible to let them all in. Hence the need to set limits and enforce them humanely. I agree with that. Uh, DeParle also says that he thinks we've made a mistake in holding back on the economic argument, which in fact, Alan Kraut did not hold back on that by noticing at the end there how important uh, immigrant labor is to the economic well-being of the country and how many business people support that. I do want to say that Acknowledging a significant margin of error is really important in this to reduce, it's a little bit of a paradox. I think if, a, if more people in the United States today who spoke in public and put forward positions would make a modest claim on certainty and an intense claim on humility, they would paradoxically be more trustworthy. So. So I, just to, uh, because I think people in Oklahoma probably tell funny stories about Texans as much as we do in Colorado, our team taught with a wonderful biology professor, of course on water in the West, Michael Grant, and he does have quite a strong Texas accent. So he's, he was doing biology, I was doing humanities angles on water in the West. At one point he was lecturing on, I think he was lecturing on acid rain, and he was using a term I just thought so embarrassing in front of the students, 
I'm not a scientist. I cannot understand what he keeps referring to here. He keeps speaking of the margin of air. And I know that's probably the proportion of nitrogen to oxygen in the air. It's probably that. But I don't know what that is. And so the fourth or fifth time my Professor Grant said something about the margin of error, I said, you'll have to tell me what that is. And he said, you've never heard of the margin of error? Ha <laughs> ha. Margin of error. OK, good. So. Uh, I think the students understood that I wasn't really, I was, might be hearing impaired, but I wasn't as ill-informed as I seemed there. So, okay, so we're going to do three historical perspectives. Uh, one of them has been quite well covered already by other speakers, so I'll be very brief on the third one. I'm going to uh, look at the North American experience of overland travel across deserts, and I'm going to suggest some zones of comparison in those episodes of travel that might um, make it easier and better to talk about, especially immigration from Mexico, Central Americans, as well as Mexican people coming into this country by overland travel. It will also do you good when you are at the airport, should you ever go to an airport again under these strange times. But if you do, uh, when they inevitably someone will announce at some point, we're going to have a two hour delay while we repair the plane or something. You will feel much better after this because you will know, as I know, I am the cheeriest person at those moments because if they say to me, we're going to take uh, two hours before we can take off and the other passengers are, oh no, all that time. I am the Western American historian thinking, this is so much faster than the Overland Trail. Who could complain at this point? So you're going to have that comfort, too. So here is my historical proposition in pattern finding and in suggesting that we should reflect along this line of, I guess you could call it time travel, thinking of uh, one era of, time, of literal overland travel and then a more recent one. Okay. In ways, this is a place where I have written this out to make sure I say exactly what I mean. In ways that thoroughly transcend the borders and lines of ethnicity and nationality, the history of travel across the deserts of North America records many stories of suffering and of human endurance tested to its limits and beyond. Sometimes that suffering has extended the boundaries of compassion, forging a life-saving tie between strangers. So, and I uh, referred to an earlier speaker at this point, Katie Benton Cohen, Cohen, who reminded us that the American Historical Association says that empathy is one of the skills of historians. So, the crossing of the continent on the Overland Trail holds a central place in American self-understanding. It is a tenable proposition to say that a number of elements of American identity are tied to the Overland Trail, to Conestoga wagons and pioneers moving westward. If you uh, then think about the enormous difference between terrestrial migration, maritime migration, immigration or migration by air transport, you can see that, in fact, terrestrial overland transportation is its own category and does deserve historical comparison in different eras. If you move across land by foot or by the labor of livestock, um, creatures that have their own biological vulnerabilities, that is a world apart from crossing by mechanical vehicles, whether it's human muscle or animal muscle, that is its own category. On the overland trail, that often involved walking because of a rightful fear of overburdening the draft animals. I'd also like to remind us that at the time of the um, Overland Trail into California, Gold Rush, 1848, 1840, then the, the big burst in immigration in 1849, 1850, remember how recently the United States had acquired California with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. So if we think, well, that was just Americans moving across American land, actually, that was really, really recent. And it is one of the most remarkable acts of human, I don't know what, nerviness, I guess, that the Amer Americans barely take over California when they start passing things called foreign miners taxes when they would have been the foreigners themselves just a year or two before. But timing is all sometimes. So if you want, now we're going to have a prize given to the silliest remark ever made by a Western American historian. And this silly remark uh, was made by the first president of the Western History Association, uh, Ray Allen Billington. This is a quotation from his book, Far Western Frontier, in which he summarizes the experience of travel on the Overland Trail in the 1840s and 1850s. The wagoners walked beside their teams, flicking their whips, while their wives and children scattered to either side to pick 
wildflowers or simply romp away some of the animal spirits bred by their healthy life. That is the prize winner for the silliest characterization of what was uh, quite different. So, big picture, the Earth's primary obstacles to human travel, migration and immigration, are oceans and deserts. And they are the primary obstacles because they both involve shortage of drinkable water, shortage of potable water, and thereby the prospects for desperate and even fatal thirst. Okay, so all of the routes east to west in the mid-19th century involved travel across the des desert and an intense experience of thirst and also a realistic fear of death if the travelers did not find water in time. The southern route, uh, going through what would be now Arizona into Southern California, the Sonoran Desert and the Colorado Desert, that was really, really tough. The central route, what is now Northern Nevada, follows the Humboldt River, which is a ratty little river, but it, it does uh, provide water to livestock as well as humans, and then it goes into a sink, then it goes underground. Then you have around 50 more miles to cross before you get to the foothills of um, the Sierra Nevada, the eastern side. So that is a long spell, and you have to put water in casks and put them in the wagons, but you have to calculate, because if you put too much water into casks, you will wear the livestock down, and they will be susceptible to exhaustion and collapse if the weight of water in the wagon is too heavy. And again, if they don't have enough water, then they will die from uh, from that. So it is an intense experience of thirst, and that is unaffected by ethnicity or nationality. There are uh, many stories of hardship on that, and I say this as uh, human nature is hard to generalize about, but I do think you can say that for nearly every human who has been on the planet, seeing another human being desperate for water has more often than not been an occasion for sympathy and compassion. So what do you do with that sympathy and compassion? Do you manage and restrict it? Do you say that the people suffering thirst were victims of overconfidence and their voluntary decision to take risks? You could certainly say that of the people on that trail in 1849, 1850. Uh, those travelers used the words barrenness, desolation, and dreariness. They had grim, grim stories of seeing dead animals. On the southern route in Arizona, they would often get to a water hole and discover that Livestock had died right there, so they could drink the water, but they could drink it with, uh, we won't go into detail here, so, uh, but dead animals would have contaminated that, that water. Uh, David Potter, a very noted American historian who, worked, who edited a diary of the Overland Trail, made this observation, if the waterless stretch of the Humboldt Desert had been a few miles wider, the rate of survival on the trail would have been cut to a fraction. People who made that crossing used phrases very common, past the journey of death. It seemed as though we had passed over the scorching valley of death to life. Okay, one thing besides the fact that that desert was not 10 miles wider, another major factor in making the trail survivable was that Americans who were already on the Pacific coast launched significant relief parties. The historian John Unruh has, has um, discussed how the Donner Party calamity in 1846-1847 led Californians to organize relief and rescue operations whenever they thought there was a threat of the repetition of those events. So there were massive relief efforts mounted from um, Oregon, Oregon as well. The Hudson's Bay Company did some of that, which was not exactly in their interest to encourage immigration, but also Americans in California. They did that partly out of economic and promotional motives. They did not see the reputation of California being enhanced by having a high death rate of people trying to respond to its promise. So there was certainly that aspect as well. Occasionally it was helping friends and family, but mostly it was helping strangers. There were public meetings to raise contributions, uh, mostly private contributions that funded this. And I'll just I'll quote John Unruh, overshadowing Everything was a vast outpouring of humanitarian aid by West Coast residents to needy immigrants. This assistance was of incalculable importance to incoming overlanders in Oregon and California. It was, as John Unruh, it was crucial to the success of the Overland Trail. So now the applied history transition. Overland travelers crossing deserts in the recent past, 
we make a shift in the time period from the mid 19th century to the late 20th century and the early 21st century and in the direction of travel and we shift to the crossing of northern Mexico and then into Arizona and California. Certain policy decisions uh, making it harder to get into El Paso or harder to get into San Diego drove the migrants into the driest areas. Uh, here these stories are very difficult, very painful to discuss. So I'll just call attention to this book. Uh, it's a collection, Migrant Deaths in the Arizona Desert, and it's very intense and very powerful about the, the uh, human remains in the desert and the process to try to identify those people and to get their kin notified and so on, and memorials and efforts to learn lessons from that. And then a book uh, that a friend wrote, my friend, Luis Alberto Rea wrote this fine book called uh, Devil's Highway. It's about the Welton, the Welton 26, uh, 26 people who had a very bad guide in the early 2000s and who the great majority of them died in the desert crossing in Arizona. So now we shift to noting The Californians and Oregonians who organized relief parties and sent people back to rescue the overland travelers who were um, at risk of the desert and then, of course, had to cross the Sierras after that, none of those relief and, and rescue people were charged with crimes. People who put water in the Arizona desert for the use of migrants, for the redemption of the lives of migrants, those people can be charged and have been charged for uh, civil and criminal violations. If you put water in, you can, if you, if law gets interpreted that way, you are harboring an illegal immigrant. So that's different. Nobody would have imagined charging, charging the re relief and rescue parties um, in the 19th century, different context. Let me say really clearly, back to the uncertainty factor, the immigrations are not equivalent, but they are worth comparing. So if I could insert into public discussion those two migrations and their desert crossings, at least a chance to think a little bit more about our conduct today and how much we want to pursue that. One of the great parts about Luis Orea's book is the spectacular way he tracks how Border Patrol officials have to sometimes make, and seem to make with some uh, alacrity, considerable alacrity, the shift from trying to track down illegal immigrants so that they can arrest and deport them, then when there is the word, as there was with the people in Orea's book, uh, a notice of how at risk these people were, they, Border Patrol can shift instantly to a search and rescue team. Interesting, just in terms of not letting our categorizations of people become unitary and rigid, that the very same people looking, not in the least to injure the, or kill the immigrants, but you can shift from track them down, apprehend them to save their lives really fast if you must. Crossing a desert demonstrates determination and a faith and opportunity. It is a physical, this is my, I'm not quoting anybody, this is just me, crossing a desert with human muscle is a physical and material testimony to belief in the promise of the United States. I just I will end this little section and then quickly move through the next one um, and then be really short on the assimilation part. Alonzo Delano was a 49er. He was crossing um, a cutoff on the Black Rock Desert, not far from where they now have the Burning Man episodes. Uh, he was walking in the desert. He was near the end of the cutoff. He was quite desperate himself. He did not know how much further he had to go before he would find the streams uh, at, the end of the, at the end of that desert crossing. He came upon a young woman and her small child left behind in a wagon. I quote Alonzo Delano's diary. Where is your husband? I inquired. He has gone on with the cattle, she replied, and to try to get us some water. But I think we will die before he comes back. Delano did not know how much further he had to go. He did not know of his own capacity to cover that distance, and he gave the woman his water flask. So, second item, um, which doesn't make my, doesn't bring me to the edge of tears, I'm happy to say this item, is just like, oh, for heaven's sake, and it does involve a good friendship of mine and an interesting bird, our former governor, Richard Lamb. Okay, 
here's on carrying capacity. I now want to shift to the common thinking about carrying capacity that has been in various eras um, in places around, around the United States. And it occurs particularly in environmental circles. So carrying capacity, uh, and this is my careful diplomatic way of putting this, trying to answer central questions about the future of their nation. Some Americans over decades have had an understandable inclination to find authority in nature, especially for the idea that the arrangements of nature have made the essential decisions and relieved human beings of that burden. So in the mid-19th century, some Americans believed that the aridity of the American West prohibited the expansion of slavery by making plantation agriculture impossible. And for some Americans in the mid-20th century, by setting, some people in, the, in our time think that by setting a stern limit on population with the idea of carrying capacity, nature has framed and enforced an immigration policy that humans can briefly defy, but eventually had to embrace. So starting in the mid-20th century and continuing in some circles from our time. So how to take this up? Carrying capacity is the idea that organisms reach the limit of their population because of the limit of the natural resources available to them. That is totally true of mule deer and prairie dogs. Mule deer and prairie dogs do not go to engineering school. It's a conspicuous limitation that they have. So they take what they have and they don't modify it. Humans have engineers, they modify the environment in all kinds of ways. They transport food with uh, an energy subsidy, they dam water, they do all kinds of stuff. So ecologists often do say it's much harder with human beings. Nonetheless, a certain sector of human beings have said that the Sierra Club, for instance, has had a very big fight over this in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, that nature has a carrying capacity and we must abide with that. We must limit our immigration in order to stay within that carrying capacity. I tried to think, how could I uh, take this up with a case study? And then I thought, oh, my friend, Governor Richard Lamb, he's the former governor of uh, Colorado. We have debated immigration a couple of times, and he is quite the case study in this. Uh, in our debates, everything I say now, I've said in public and, and had him respond to me. So here are uh, Dick Lamb quotations. The West teaches us that there is such a thing as carrying capacity and that we must respect the fragility of the land and the environment. We must adapt to nature and we must be aware of nature's limitations. The unspoiled, beautiful Colorado that stirred me, quoting him so deeply, uh, growing up here has fallen prey to unchecked unchecked immigration-induced population growth, we must abide by the carrying capacity. He was a leader in the Sierra Club fight over immigration. Well, what's wrong with that? Humans can do a lot more than any other creature. Humans can try to displace these difficult decisions onto nature, but it is far more complicated than that. The rate of consumption of resources is far more important than just the sheer numbers of the population. Human beings fluctuate in their thinking about reproduction, and what these folks seem particularly not to notice is that the rate of population growth in the United States is at the lowest in a century. It's starting from a big base, that's true, but it, it has leveled out. Uh, the drop in immigration is, is significant in that, we've already covered that, but also the drop in the uh, reproduction of native-born Americans. So it's an interesting idea. The baby boomers are aging. We certainly have that evidence. The workforce issues raised here are significant. And overpopulation is not, the thing for those of us who are baby boomers to fear is a lack of a labor force to see us through the tough times ahead. So, okay, so that, uh, so I propose building quickly off of, off of Alan's thing that the environmentalists who are tempted by this notion of inherent limits to growth from uh, natural resources should have to take at least half an hour on Madison Grant's birthday. And Madison Grant's birthday is November 19th, born in 1865, and there should just be a hard half hour every environmentalist to think, think about how wonderful it is that that conservationist Madison Grant helped to preserve the redwoods. We are in so much happier state from having those redwoods, and that's the same guy Alan Kraut just walked us through who had, um, anti-Semitism to the nth power and so on. So just reflect on that, reflect that this man, Madison Grant, was a great preservation of, of nature and also had abhorrent attitudes towards uh, his fellow human beings. Last item, very quickly, uh, three and a half seconds really, assimilation. 
Assimilation is a word, and we've had some good uh, discussions of it. Assimilation is a word and a concept that has had a rough run over the last century. It, it's a word where we want to breathe deeply and reconsider and repurpose it very carefully because we need that word to be in good health and we need it to be robust and we need it to be reflected on so that we can tell the difference between coercive assimilation and invitational assimilation. And history is abundant in case studies of both of those. The settlement houses of the late 19th century and early 20th century had some elements of coercion and they also had invitational elements. Come in. Join us. Tell us about yourselves. Fit in. And as a member of the National Council on the Humanities um, Board where we review proposals, I can tell you what is going on in humanities funding in this nation is so wonderfully reminiscent of those settlement houses. The settlement houses that used literature and drama and theater as so much of a part of their persuasion and invitation the National Endowment for the Humanities, I'm happy to say, to tell you taxpayers, your dollars are going to things very much in that spirit of welcome to our world with veterans, with, uh, with people, uh, working class people trying to rise to different occupations, with all sorts of people. The humanities are really in that spirit. So that is the dream, is to take the concept of assimilation, to look for cautionary tales where it was used coercively and to look for the invitational, inspirational examples, and to get over Star Trek. Because, I didn't know this until very recently, but the most hated villains in Star Trek's many incarnations have been the, uh, the kind of creatures called the Borgs, and they are cyborgs, and they are very, does anybody know the Borgs already? On, you probably know them better than I do, because I. I wouldn't want to know them or meet them, I'm sure of that. So, so they uh, are a collective and they are kind of a group mind and they uh, approach other planets and other spe um, species in the universe and they say, we are the Borg, lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Uh, to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. So what we need is some just delightful creatures. They could, I don't care if they're furry or not, it doesn't really matter, but we need some popular culture producers to give us some assimilators who are delightful, who are welcoming, who are pleasant, uh, and who do not do it against our will and who just say, join us. Uh, and I know that there is a young person with talents I will never be able to imagine who could sketch that right now who could just sketch these delightful creatures who welcome you into their world, and they, can use, they have to use the word assimilate, but they have to give it a whole other meaning than what those Borgs had in mind. Thank you. Actually, I, I misspoke horribly there. People probably noticed that. I, the last phrase there, what the Borgs had in mind, they didn't have minds. They gave those up, so. Good luck, Borgs, having anything in mind. I'm glad I clarified that. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Big hand for Patty Limerick. <laughs> we have time for questions. And as, as always, our, our wonderful Crimson Club uh, members will be going around with microphones. Uh, please wait till they get there. And I'll try and keep a tally of the order of hands going up. Hi, I was going to ask you about Jill Lepore's latest in New Yorker, but your last comment um, made me first ask, Lawrence Lex Lessig has been describing now broadcast journalism at a time of economic growth as being key to bring us together because we had 50 million people watching Judgment at Nuremberg as they got interrupted by the Selma riots so we could link up two things at the same time as a mass and bring things together. But the question I was going to ask, and that might be the, uh, uh, something to be built on, but is um, uh, Jill Lepore was talking about in our darkest hour in the 1930s how we were suffering and we start having teach-ins in schools across the country. 
Is that something that we could be thinking about also, having a 21st century vision of teach-ins in public schools? Uh, well, I, I fear I didn't finish Jill's article, and I've been intending to do something about that, but not in time. So I'm going to step away from the podium and get it on my phone and read it. No, I'm not, <laughs> not going to do that. But I am going to say, uh, I think this is a question full of implications because it is time to be very innovative and, and just kind of uncontrolled and thinking of what counts as meaningful communication. So you are such good sports and you were sitting here practicing a custom that came from medieval Europe. Uh, nearly a millennium ago, of people sitting in lectures while this person stands up and talks. So young folks are so much more able to come up with forms of communication, whether those are memes or whatever. So just that challenge of thinking, yes, education, yes, but maybe education in a whole other mode than what we have practiced. Uh, the phrase, okay, boomer, is thought to be pejorative and negative. I think it's an olive branch, intergenerational olive branch, with a, its olive branch sharpened to a kind of um, sharp point at the end, which is not the worst thing to do with an olive branch. But, but I wouldn't be the one to say we have this figured out. We know I couldn't agree with you more that more uh, engaged exchange and conversation, and something that is better than that. Oh, it's so noble and it's so pathetic. Fact checking, oh, fact checking, it's so noble and people work so hard at it and it, and it, does, and it doesn't advance the ball at all. If it, it's just the people who already were on board with the results of the fact checking or yeah, I knew that, oh Lord. So, so something that really says, this is confirmation bias, this is how you deal with it. If people have expectations and are only, so I just think there's so much, it's so exciting and so delightful to think what could happen with animation, with all, just all kinds of stuff. So yes, uh, but, but I'm not in charge is the good news of how to present that because I don't know, sense of humor is very useful until it isn't, so. Hi, so I'm just wondering um, in terms of the population and the demographics that you mentioned, do you think that immigrants will actually benefit the increasing elder population that's projected in the next 50 years when our um, population pyramid basically looks more like Japan um, and right. there's a smaller working force? You think, um, just your opinion, you think immigrants will really benefit in that area yeah. of the United States economy? Yes, thank you. Uh, in fact, when Dick Lamb and I have done our debates, we get right there because his naivete and thinking that, uh, I don't know what, that something will come in with all of these old people that will relieve, oh, young people, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm really sorry, because there's a lot of us and we are going to be crabby because we are the ones who said, don't trust anyone over 30. Well, that didn't work out. So we, we are the ones who are uh, extremely surprised by aging. Now, where did that come from? As if, so it's just, so to relieve you, and this is, I, I guess I'm just gonna say this in totally cynical terms. If we don't have a bunch of folks who see elder care as something they want to do and find pleasure in, you guys are really in a mess because what my parents were in very rough shape in their late 80s. My sister, who is quite conservative and not a particular supporter of uh, immigration rights, she and I went to the hospital cafeteria and we had watched a couple of Filipino people deal with our poor, poor, burdened, troubled parents who were not making an ounce of sense really. And, their conduct there, but these folks were so kind to them. And we went to the cafeteria and my sister said, my heart has been changed from that. So I don't know what else can happen because the, the demographics are just not subtle about the, the disproportion of the elderly 
either just about, well, I don't know, they're all running for president. That's what they're all doing now. They're all just doing, doing that. Um, and that's not necessarily going to help. I don't know if it, maybe it will help. I don't know. So, but I, I just think that is such an essential labor force thing. And I don't, I, I know I'm sounding exploitative of immigrant labor, but they saved us. Those folks saved us in a time where we couldn't save ourselves. And Zenny was the Filipino woman, who, Filipina, who was so, so kind. And my sister and I just dreamed of having Zenny come live with us. And we would come home from a hard day at school, and Zenny would say, would you like some lemonade? And we go, yes, I would, Zenny. That's so kind. And so anyway, so I'm not ready for Zenny just yet, but yes. And, and, and I just don't see that as subtle. It's not something that you have to sit and look at those demographic arrangements and think, oh, what could that mean? It's just so, this is when we're going to close the borders? That's the main mic. The one person I oh, know, no, I know, but Mike is the, the other fellow here. Um, thanks, Patty. So you give us these stories of compassion in the desert. And when we think about immigration, this is something that's physically felt very regionally, especially in the South and Southwest, but debated politically across the nation. How do we teach compassion for something that we no longer meet these people in the desert, but we talk about them from afar? Right. Um, how do we keep that compassion forward and physical and teachable? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that question because, uh, as I said, I. I try to think, have I actually met people who would stand in the presence of a person dying of thirst and refuse them water? And I've attended one or two pretty weird department meetings, we'll just say that. So, so just, uh, that was gratuitous and unnecessary. Uh, I've seen one or two people that I think, I think my problem was that I am a Rotarian and I would go to my Rotary meetings at noon on Fridays where there's just, oh, let's help with this and let's help with that. And then I would go to a department meeting and it seemed that the world had contracted to be when I, so join Rotary young people, that will help with your future as well. So anyway, um, I, I think the question is, it's almost tied exactly to his, his issue about uh, communication because no, it does not work. If somebody is uh, facing very bad hardship and they're, completely out of your range of vision and you don't know them and you don't know their mother and you don't know their daughter and you don't know anything. They're, and there's so much of that. The compassion fatigue is an important term because how can you keep responding to that? So I, I believe I'm going to tell one story of, of two things that I thought, well, that worked. So, okay, so I believe that there are ways of, uh, certainly YouTube is a, possibility in di different ways to convey that, although it is a little bit on the edge of exploiting suffering to do such a thing. So uh, the, uh, the uh, Border Institute, which is in Nogales, uh, named after the great Arizona priests, anyway, they, I took a bunch of our people, Center of the American West board members there, and we heard about what that group does to help people uh, when they're deported to go back with clothing, because of course they take your belt away and then you don't have a, uh, a belt and you're taken back. So my board members for the Center of the American West, who are a kind group of people who had never thought about that. The first really funny thing is that the priest says, uh, well, we do need belts and we need trousers. And then he looked at our group and he said, you're all too big a little bit portly in some of our group there, and so that's not gonna work for what, what they need. But people were just, when we're getting on the bus, my people were just saying, how can we make a difference for, for the Keno, it's the Keto Border Institute, how can we make this group function? And as a university, we can't say support this group, but, but the board members took over for that. So that was something about, there was a picture of what a woman's feet the soles of her feet had looked like after she, after her shoes gave up and she was walking across the desert. And that was a photograph. We don't know who she was. Her privacy wasn't compromised, but that's quite a picture for saying what desert crossings can, can mean. So I think that's one thing. Then in Boulder, we have a group called the Modus Theater and they have encapsulated the stories of DACA kids uh, help them write these so that they are 10 or 12 minutes that really tell you what it is like to live without documents. And then people from 
who are not DACA kids by a long shot, are recruited to read those stories on behalf of the DACA kids. So I did that. The first group they did very publicly was uh, law enforcement officials in Boulder read those stories. And I wanted, it's not competitive, I certainly don't have a competitive streak, but I wanted something that would be as interesting as law enforcement people. So I had three fraternity presidents, CU fraternity presidents, join me. And they were so spectacular and just going all out in empathy. and. So I think there are things like that. Does it scale up, as we always used to have to ask about these things? I don't care if it scales up. Having that evening with these three fraternity gentlemen join me, did that change the balance of opinion? Will that show up in the, in the polls? I don't know. And it doesn't really matter to me, because to be there and to see that that happen was such a spectacular uh, moment of liking our species very much, just becoming enchanted again with our, as I am right now, looking at all of you, enchanted by what a cool species we have. That might be a good note to, you think? We're going to take uh, about a 10 minute break and then we'll have a final uh, wrap up panel session that Patty Limerick will moderate. And about uh, 25 minutes of that session will be uh, our speakers for today, uh, adding some further thoughts and reflections. And then the second half will be your questions. So if you haven't received a card and you'd like to write down a question for us, I'm gathering those questions. Uh, those cards are still coming around, I I'm hoping. Uh, if they're not, then just find a piece of paper, borrow a piece of paper from somebody. Well, once they've given it to you, I think it's hard to give it back, but um, you know, procure a piece of paper and write down your questions and we'll gather again in about 10 minutes time.
going to hand me Britney cards when I put oh, okay. These are the questions that people in the audience wrote oh. down. So I'll just yeah, leave them with you. Will you be bringing me in more, or is that? Are uh, we if more come, if okay. more come to me, then I'll. Okay. I think may have. If that, if not, that's fine too. Yeah, I think this will be enough. And I think what I'll do is maybe we'll run about 25 minutes worth of panels. All right. Hi, everybody. If any of the folks sitting in the back wanted to, to move down a little bit, um, I'll, I'll give you some money if you come down. A, a quite sizable sum of money. Students in the back, I, I, should, should we negotiate a price? Could, come on, come on down. Come on down. Thank you. Big hand for the students who are now coming down. That's it. Wonderful. It's only going to be half as much as I would have given you because you've only come halfway down. That's good. Now, it, if you'd like, that would be great. But this is good. Thank you. Well, again, thanks to uh, everybody in the audience, for those of you who've been with us for the whole day. Uh, before we move to uh, the panel, uh, I'd like to just once more thank our whole uh, group of uh, speakers. Uh, Katie Benton Cohen from Georgetown led us off this morning. Big hand for Katie Benton Cohen. <laughs> Cesar Garcia Hernandez. Uh, from University of uh, Denver College of Law. <laughs> Thomas Jimenez from Stanford University. <laughs> Alan Kraut from American University. <laughs> and Patty Limerick from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Patty's going to moderate uh, the discussion among the panelists for about 25 minutes, and then we'll turn to your uh, questions. A number of you have written questions down, and if we get through those, we'll turn to more questions from the floor. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could we just join in thanking Dean David Robel? I don't know. There are some things about getting older that are just a delight, and knowing someone when he was a kid kind of and then it's just wonderful and now he's a dean for heaven's sake it just makes you believe in progress and possibility so jumping off from that this is a subject that we have been covering that does not always raise the spirits the study of history here can be uh, and the study of the present can be pretty weighty and can weigh down the soul so you seem to be people who are on the planet in a pretty, let's take it on way. So uh, without, with whatever degree of self-revelation you're comfortable with or not, uh, don't do that. But just tell us how you deal with the topic that has such a capacity to impress us with human beings as determined people who persist and so on, we certainly all that. But um, I just as soon find out that Madison Grant was a character cooked up for Star Trek and wasn't actually a real person. That'd be all right with me to find out that he was a, a fictional character. So I don't know, just how do you navigate the 
I don't want to make it so simple as optimism or pessimism or faith in human nature or despair over human nature, but just along that spectrum, not two poles, just say whatever you want to say about how you yourself take in your knowledge and get up in the morning ready to engage with the world. Well, that's an easy question to start with, isn't it? That really is. The ah, card, there it goes. Okay. okay. Um, I think part of being a historian is being able to put your own life and the, the world that you live in into a broader context uh, of, of human experience. And for me, that leaves me with a, a strange kind of optimism. I'm very optimistic uh, about the human condition, and I'm very optimistic about the immigrant experience. And I'm optimistic about it because I've seen it work, uh, both in terms of my own family, but also in terms of uh, previous experience. And so, you know, at one point I ran into Sam Hunt uh, Huntington, who I mentioned in my uh, talk at the Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington. And I said to him, you know, that's a really pessimistic view. And he said, and yours is so optimistic. And I said, yes, it is, because I think uh, having seen in my own family the process of migration and integration into a, a new society, I know that it works, it has worked, it is working, and I see the fruits of it. And that makes me optimistic. And that doesn't mean that it's easy or that it's the same experience for every group that comes to the United States, but that uh, in the, the long arc of history, which Martin Luther King talked about is bending toward justice. For me, the long arc of history bends toward the success of uh, the immigrant experience of being uh, an important part, a crucial part of the American success story. And so uh, I find myself always very optimistic that all of the defeats are kind of short-term setbacks rather than a defeat of the endeavor, the larger endeavor. I share that view. Um, and Patty, taking your call to, to be modest in, uh, in, in our certainty um, and, and to you know, just fully disclose the degree to which I argue with myself about whether I should be optimistic or pessimistic, um, for the most part, I, I, I share Alan's view. I think when I look at the, the long arc of history, I think it uh, it shows that um, immigration has always been um, something that immigrants themselves and the society that, in, that to which they immigrate feel ambivalent about. Uh, but when the process of immigration unfolds and when over generations there is some sense of integration, the ambivalence tilts more toward um, optimism than, than pessimism. Having said that, um, that's cold comfort to people who are living in the conditions that Cesar described. It's cold comfort to people who are trekking across the Sonora Desert and across rivers and across the Mediterranean. Um, and so I don't want to be so optimistic as to ignore their plight and act as though whatever happened in the past will work itself out in the future and, and, uh, and sort of solve all their problems. Um, but when I think about the role that immigration plays in the United States, I'm very much uh, in, in agreement with Alan's view. And, and it also comes from my own family. My, my father was undocumented. My father was deported when he was in eighth grade and came back legally. And that legalization made a huge difference in his life. And so some of this is biographical, and it turns out it corresponds with the data. So. Um, so I, I mean, I can't choose that kind of optimistic or pessimistic thing. I think I'm both, and I actually think that's a perfect reflection of how immigrants feel about the process of gain and loss and how American society feels about the process of change that, that immigrants bring with it. For, for me, I think it comes from a sense of what's the alternative. I have to be hopeful. If I'm, if I'm 
truly a small d democrat that is somebody who believes in this experiment in democracy that is comprised of, that was hatched up and, and comprised, breathed life into by fallible people, by people who are imperfect, by people who are contradictory, complicated human beings, then every step of the way is going to reflect all of those contradictions. It's, there are gonna be missteps. Um, that's inherent in the process of this, this experiment in, 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 in democracy that we call the United States of America. Um, and, and so for me, it's a question of, uh, I think it boils down to, well, this is, uh, th this is um, uh, the, the, the next step that I wanna see this political community take. Um, and so I have to be willing to believe that this political community that I have the great privilege of being part of can do that. Um, because if we don't articulate that vision, it's certainly never gonna happen in, um, on its own. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna take it in a different direction and acknowledge something that while I share uh, much of the sentiments of my um, panel here, also as someone who's taught an immigration history seminar every semester, not every year, one semester a year for the last several years, when we begin the class, I ask them, you know, what's the news today? And it's invariably more horrible each week than the week before. And I finally, and then on Twitter, where I actually interact with a lot of people who work on immigration, and people are at, you know, really depressed places with this for understandable reasons. And I finally, to my students last fall, I teach an evening class for Cornell's students who are doing a semester in Washington. And I said to them, I said, look, I need to cop to something here. I need to, I need to acknowledge my own privilege in this. I have outrage, but this is not gonna affect me personally in the way that it's affecting millions and millions of people, both in the United States, but of course around the world as they try to seek asylum or refugee status or legal status or cross deserts. And I said, there's something in me that can't express the level of emergency that this is, but please understand that my emotional limitations are not a reflection on how severe this moment is, right? And I, I felt like I just couldn't proceed as normal without recognizing that there's something in my makeup that, you know, and also my position of privilege that I, I wasn't gonna fall apart in the classroom over it, but I said, you know, if you do, it's understandable, right? So that's one piece. The other piece goes back to my piece about empathy and what I think has to be a kind of radical empathy that we have to share. I think there are a few people out there, and I unfortunately think one of them is in the White House, who lack the fundamental tools to practice empathy. But I think those people are rare. And one thing that was really hard for me in the late 90s and the early 2000s as, as people across the country really began to flip out about immigration is that I couldn't understand where they were coming from. And I finally, and I like your point, Alan, that we have to contextualize our own lives. I alluded to the fact that my, both my grandfather and my mother grew up on the US-Mexico border. And I grew up in the Phoenix area. And I, things that seem natural to me, like living in a majority Latino community as an Anglo person, were very new and alarming experiences for people in meatpacking towns in Iowa or you know, farm communities in North Carolina. It doesn't excuse xenophobia, but it does help me understand that some people out there were experiencing new things that seemed not new to me. And that I have to practice a kind of radical empathy of saying, how can we get past that? And I think that point that Alan makes about assimilation takes time or immigrant integration and we all need to be involved in various ways, helped me to see, okay, they're on one point of a process that I see because of my own unique family history, not because I'm better than them. And so I try to return to that to understand where these fears come from and not be paralyzed by them. So that's what I would say about that. Thank you, those are all great answers. Uh, so David, I'm gonna sort of be interweaving questions from the audience along with my own because we do have one that goes directly to that, uh, a question about empathy. Some people say that a rapid infl influx of Migrants makes them feel like strangers in their own town, their own country. They fear no longer feeling at home in the only home they know. What would you say to such people about their feelings and their fears? You just have uh, spoken of that, but, but Tomas, especially if you would talk about the 
uh, established society and its complexities and jangledness and because I, I will just say one of the things that makes you think okay assimilation to what yeah. what have we got in the way of a united national set of beliefs and principles that we could say come on in and join us in this shared faith uh, so so Right. I mean, why did, so you were just I, I, there, because so. I'll probably forget it because I'm very tired. But I like to I, I have this belief that if we could just change two things in the United States about uh, us, we could improve our politics dramatically. First of all, if everyone could get more comfortable being uncomfortable, we could make incredible strides as a community. That's number one. Number two is could we get rid of the idea that you get what you deserve? And what I mean by that also is not only great good fortune, but also misfortune, right? The fact is that people don't get what they deserve. Some people get very lucky and some people get very unlucky, regardless of how hard they work. I don't mean that that's not important. And those two things I think would help with regard, I did this and this and this, I deserve this from my community. Um, but the, the last point, so those are just my, my political beliefs uh, in a nutshell, my philosophical beliefs about how we might improve civil society. But I wanna say that I wrote a chapter in my book, Inventing the Immigration Problem, on really just this and a young man named Jet Locke who uh, had a bachelor's degree in economics and ended up running the whole 20 report series on immigrants and industries and he was not a bad person in fact in some ways he was a very very fine man he got caught up in this he grew up in a small town in west virginia as a descendant of a scots irish railroad station master and he couldn't he could not himself assimilate to the reality of all of these communities that he visited that had new immigrants that were you know bohemian or slovenian or polish or what have you and he couldn't get past it it bothered him so much and he understood that they might assimilate over time but that there were too many of them and that stood in the way of him figuring out a broader vision for what he thought about the united states so this is not an uncommon problem, that he was trapped by one vision of what a community might be and couldn't get past that. And I, and I think to tragic results that even he thought were tragic in some ways. I mean, I think of assimilation as something that we're all doing. We have this notion that, assimila that immigrants come here and there's some target that they should orient themselves to to belong and then they kind of march generally over the course of generations towards that target and, and become part of the, the kind of mainstream of American society. And one of the things that sociologists have contributed to this conversation among many things is that um, as immigrants, if we, if we take that metaphor that there is some target and that target is a mainstream, that when immigrants and their descendants enter the mainstream, they change the character of the mainstream itself. When we talk about the imprint that immigrants have had on American society culturally, um, politically, demographically, um, many of those changes bear their um, most prominent imprint on things that we now take for granted as normally American. You know, um, Teddy Roosevelt said there are no hyphenated Americans, and to be American today is to describe yourself in hyphenated terms. The idea of the Judeo-Christian American society, there was no Judeo in there at one time, and the Christian part certainly did not include Catholics, and this is not to mention a number of things that we regard as normal American things, things we eat, words we say, songs we sing, that, bear, that, that have their roots in immigrant populations. But to answer that question more directly, what would I say to somebody who, um, who said there are all these immigrants coming here and, and I'm having trouble getting used to it, is, the, is to go back to the, that notion that assimilation is a two-way street and, and the changes that happen are a result of people interacting, repelling each other, struggling through what is a bumpy process of getting accustomed to one another. And the same sense of gain and loss that immigrants feel, the same sense of gain and loss that the children of immigrants feel has a kind of synonym on the part of people who are well established in a place when they see a population show up that they don't recognize that have different skin colors that speak a different language practice different religions there's a profound sense of gain and loss and that sense of gain and loss tends to attenuate 
over time. You know, there a lot of um, cities in the Midwest have changed pretty dramatically in the last three decades. In social science, we call them the new gateways. Um, there are new gateways in Oklahoma. Uh, and it turns out that they're not so new gateways anymore. They're not that new. There's an adult second generation living in these gateways. And some of the social scientists, I actually think, have been behind a little bit on this. But some of the media reporting on places in Iowa, for example, show that there was a lot of conflict at first and that uh, as people kind of got used to being around one another, that conflict kind of um, gave way to something quite different. There's a sociologist, one of the founding founders of sociologists named Robert Park, who talked about an assimilation cycle. Uh, and I think there's, there's the, a lot of people have rejected that notion. I actually think there's some truth to it. I think the unsettled quality is a part of the American experience. And uh, while this may be a strange statement, we're actually better at it than many other countries in the world because we've experienced it so many times. And the individual who walks into the community store, the community bank, and is troubled by the fact that the clerk doesn't speak English as they anticipate uh, is very unsettling. It's unsettling to have these changes in your world. And yet, we are better at it because we're more experienced with it than many other countries in the world. I gave a paper in Stockholm in 1991, and I remember a, a government minister saying, no matter who you are, no matter what color you are, no matter what religion you are, if you say you're a Swede and you obey our laws, you're a Swede. I don't think he would say the same thing today. Uh, because uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway have, have been challenged by populations they hadn't anticipated and by uh, people who don't share their history or their physical appearance. And uh, unlike the United States where we, we can talk about waves of migration and wa waves of assimilation, they can't do that. And they're struggling mightily. And I've given talks in Washington to, to visiting groups when they say, you know, you, you Americans, you're good at this. You've done this before. We haven't. What's the secret? Can I add a, can I add a footnote just to that? I don't, with, at the risk of dominating here. Um, one of the other things is not just that we've done it before, it's that having done it before, it is a core part of a version of American identity that a lot of people hold dear. That to be, that, you know, the idea of the nation of immigrants, which really wasn't a thing until about the mid-20th century, but, and there are competing notions of American identity, but one of them, and, and the one that I think informs a sense of horror about what's happening today, is that it feels like it is un-American what we're doing. We hold our history of immigration, our history of assimilation, and, the, and, and for some of us, the contemporary wave of immigrants, we hold that as a core part of who we are, not just as an ethnic identity, as in a national identity. And so what's happening feels like it is sort of, um, it is an attempt to puncture that version of American identity that a lot of us subscribe to. I just want to say one thing when I go to it, I mean, DC, of course, is a very global city, but in a particular kind of way. But when I go to Los Angeles or, or even, you know, Las Vegas or New York City, and I think about the people who are unsettled by this, I think, honey, that ship has sailed. You know, just get on, you know, it's, that ship has sailed. Like, you're not going to, nativism is not going to work, right? Like, I just, I just feel practically speaking, you need to move on because that's, it's too late. It's too late. Um, so I have a, a couple of questions. This one, okay, we live in such a bubble, how can we get these messages to the masses? That makes me just want to annotate that a little, that uh, whatever American people did before in confronting diversity, they were so blessed and they did not have social media in the picture. That was those, that's the golden age in some ways, not in every way, I guess. But, but that has so scrambled the capacity to misunderstand each other or to lodge in non-communication units. So, but I want to add, so I want you to, to, if anyone wants to say something about how different these last, this last quarter century is um, from technology, which does shape these things. But I want to add to it this really interesting question that I think we'll all be quite entranced by this. 
how does America's troubled immigration history play into the consciousness of immigrant communities? How does it affect their self-perception and their sense of possibility and, and hope? Uh, and if, if you choose to say something about the social media game changer, that would be fine. But that question of what is it like to be the perceived other who is actually the self? Well, I think some of us, uh, you can speak to this very well, is what, what does it feel like to be perceived as the other? Some of us in, in our lives have had that experience. Uh, you know, the first Jew to walk in a, uh, to a particular Ivy League university uh, or to be in a particular kind of social situation knows what it feels like acutely, believe me, from my own experience, to be the other. Uh, to, to find yourself in a strange land, in a strange place. Uh, and so it shouldn't surprise us when we see groups of people arriving in the United States who are also undergoing this experience and who are struggling to, to, to negotiate their place in American society. And that's the way I look at it. If there's one word that I would use that's my favorite word in describing this experience, it's the word negotiation. That one negotiates as an individual and one negotiates from a generational perspective. The negotiation that my grandfather and my father conducted uh, in their encounter with America is different from my negotiation with it. Uh, and my daughter's is very different. Uh, and so I see it as an ongoing process, of this integrating into American life and society, and not something that's static. Right. I just want to clarify for us that uh, I am now integrating questions into this. So, okay, I'm a little bit confused because I thought I was to be using so I, I, I thought I was doing audience participation by reading the questions, but I'm not I'm supposed to cut off these questions and go to the, at the very end. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, oh, me too, me too. And I just, I was just a little bit troubled by the fact that I had, um, okay, good. No, I think, I, for, for me, I think the, the, uh, the, 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 the sense of the United States is, 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 is important because the community that I was born and raised into in South Texas is not the community that I found myself in as an 18-year-old in college in Rhode Island. And that's not the same community as the one I live in now in Denver. Um, and, and yet we're all part of the United States or we're not, right? And so they get the, the sense that um, that 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 the, that the onus is on people of color, on immigrant communities, to somehow incorporate themselves into the existing community, is somewhat narrow for me. Because for me, the the existing community is is the inverse. Right? For me, it's not white people who have been in the United States for generations, even if that's two generations or three generations and not 15 generations, right? For me, it's a, it's a heavily Mexican, heavily Spanish-speaking community. And so when I go around speaking Spanish in public today, um, as I do most days, um, it, that is the same way I've operated in, in, in my, in my sort of non-professional, non outside of, outside of academic environments every day of most of, 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 of my life. That's normal for me, right? And, 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 and it's not because, and, and so the sense that the United States is, 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 is being, um, being, uh, uh, adjusted by, by immigrant communities that is certainly on the macro level. That is certainly right, always always true. On a micro level, right? It's important to keep in mind that that the folk, those of us who are making, who are who are the people who are moving, um, have a very different perspective, right? And one that is equally valid, right? It, as 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 the folks who are being made uncomfortable by the fact that all of a sudden I show up. And, and I have four names and four accents, and there's a bunch of Spanish coming out of my, my mouth. This question, okay. Okay, so I think we're going a little bit international here for a moment. Are, uh, I'm gonna put two questions together. Are there any countries of any size or any location that are enjoying success in assimilating immigrants in a fashion that might serve as an example for the United States? 
and uh, match to that and a question about our relationship to other nations. What can we do to make life livable in countries that immigrants are trying to escape? So any combination of those, a little bit of the, is there a utopian group out there that we should be learning from? And what can we do to take really dystopian societies and get them in better Well, shape? as I said a moment ago, I think many of these societies are looking to us uh, as the model for these encounters because we've had them so often in our history and very often they haven't, especially in Northern Europe. <clears throat> but um, I think other countries are now getting that experience. I think uh, the movement of peoples uh, through Turkey and Greece and into Germany uh, and into France, um, these societies now are in a position where they have to negotiate, they have to adjust, um, and uh, I think it's a very dynamic period. Um, I would say I want to distinguish immigration and refugee policy here. I think we haven't given enough credit to places like Lebanon that have had to take on millions of refugees <clears throat> at great actual financial cost and also cost to their civil society and that they're kind of at, I mean, speaking of carrying capacity, and that we haven't given enough credit, I think, uh, to that process. And also with regard to refugee policy, I think we could, immigration is a complicated issue in Canada in ways that are somewhat analogous to the United States. I think there's things they do better, but I certainly think they do refugee policy better. And they adopt, they have an, a model in which really a community adopts a refugee family. And I actually have the great privilege of spending a month every summer in Nova Scotia, Canada, in small town Nova Scotia, where that county has adopted a few Syrian refugee families. And that means they fundraise and advocate for them at the farmer's market. You can sign up to help them with their English classes or drive their kids to school. And this is something that happens on the private level right in the U.S., and I won't sidebar that. But I think that is a, a model that requires a kind of buy-in in which you are a good citizen of your community if you participate in that. And it's really a beautiful thing to see. And it brings, it's a civic building process for the, for the people who live in this community as well. Um, I forgot the other thing, so. I want to add that, um, so most, most people don't want to leave home, right? Most people who do leave home don't leave their countries. Most people who leave their countries don't go very far. They stay in the neighboring country, somewhere nearby. They, they are not getting to the United States. They're not getting to, Northern, to, to Western Europe. And partly it's because they can't. It's expensive. It's really hard. You have to have social capital. You have to have financial capital. Partly it's because people don't want to. Right? It's, it, it move, displacing your life is difficult. Right? So the sense that everyone who is making less than a dollar a day, everyone who is poor, Every, however you define that, right? Everyone who's in a hard situation in life, however you define that, wants to move to Oklahoma City, right? To Denver, to New York, right? To Paris or London. It's false. Most people don't want to go, leave, right? And so to the extent that the United States is interested in helping countries get up off their feet, we need to take a really hard look at what we have done in the past to help those places become as difficult as they are to live in now, right? So when we're thinking about Central America today, we need to think about what happened during the 1980s when Central Americans came to the United States traumatized by war, war that we had a hand in, right? And then we, we, we found that the children who were growing up in places like LA started becoming assimilating to some of the difficult aspects of urban life in the 1980s in LA joining gangs, engaging in the criminal activity, and how did we solve our gang problem? Deportation, right? Takes a little while, but then the, the, the cycle continues to repeat itself, and now those, those gangs have blossomed into MS-13, and, right, into, into uh, Mara Salvatrucha, uh, and helping to displace another generation of folks, right? So, so the United States, a isn't the place that everyone turns to, and B is not the source of all solutions. Uh, uh, a quick trip back in history with a question, and then we're going to move through history to the present. Uh, in the progressive era, did people think America was full, or did it still need more people, just not the wrong people? 
quotation marks there. I'll answer that with, um, I was able to answer a question that I thought queued up a component of the Dillingham Commission that was very intriguing uh, because it didn't work. But it tells us something about the sensibility of a different era that this group of nine gentlemen, you saw the picture of, were absolutely passionate about this idea of distribution. And you may have heard of the story, for example, of the Galveston port, where the United States opened a port at Galveston hoping that lots and lots of, and this was at the pressure of Jewish reform leaders, but they were hoping that they could kind of stem the tide of, of, of especially Eastern European Jewish immigrants from New York and the East Coast and have them go up through Galveston. In the end, it wasn't as successful as they had hoped, but it reflected a vision that yes, in fact, there was a big open country out there and that there was plenty of room for immigrants. So this is one of the ways in which I argue that in that earlier period, eugenics, you know, this, the, the kind of Madison Grant really disgusting these people are racially inferior and they're gonna bring down the racial stock thing had not taken full flower. And there was really an idea that like, let's, it went along with the anti-urbanism of the day, right? We were still ideologically a rural nation and there was an idea that we ought to send these folks out to, to places that needed population, that wanted population. You know, there were Jewish homesteaders in South Dakota and North Dakota. So uh, not a lot, right? Cause it turned out they didn't, not that many of them actually wanted to go. They wanted to go to the Lower East Side. But, but the fact of the matter is that yes, there was that idea and there was an idea that immigrants would be able to, to do some of that work. Uh, there was an experiment of um, replacing African American sharecroppers in the South with immigrants from places like Italy in Bohemia. Now this was racist because they thought they might be better workers, but it was also a reflection of African American activism like, you know what, we don't want these jobs, we're moving north, right? So, uh, so you can see that as a, as a two-way street as well. Those schemes didn't really work either, but they're one of the reasons why there are tomatoes in some Louisiana food. I just got back from Louisiana because a lot of Italians ended up, South Italians ended up in Louisiana for this very reason. Um, and faced quite a bit of discrimination there themselves. So I would say, yes, that that, that certainly was um, a component of, of that era. That some areas were full and others Correct. needed. Okay. Uh, at what point in time did immigration concerns shift from individuals in Southern Eastern Europe to individuals from Central and Southern America? What were the reasons for this shift in individuals that raised concern in the United States? Go for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm going to answer a question about history in, in the presence of two historians, so. Give it a shot. Hold, yeah, buckle your seatbelt. Three, I can uh, just point out. Three. Oh, three. Oh, sorry, Patty, yes, you're, <laughs> yes, you, of sir. course, of course. Um, so I just want you to feel a little bit more nervous about it. So yes, even history. more nervous yeah. now, yeah. and Cesar knows more about history than I do, so let's just say four. At any rate, um, when did the shift happen? Well, um, the 1924 law that, that I know both, um, both Katie and Alan referred to, that, that place quotas on Southern and Eastern European immigration kind of came after the peak of mass European immigration. Um, and there was a sense after that, and I'm kind of drawing on a historian named David Rodiger's work. There was a sense that after that, that um, immigrants were no longer a threat because they were no longer coming. And we could kind of move on now to the important work of assimilating them. And they did have in those times a very uh, a very kind of narrow notion of what assimilation meant. Um, the fears about, and I'll say in particular about Mexican immigrants, has really been there since the Southwest was was part of Mexico. And the, in, in those days, there were not fears about Mexican immigrants. There were fears about the Mexicans that were already in the territory. It's estimated 75,000 that were already in the territory and whether they were fit to be American citizens. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 made them American citizens one way or another. Uh, and they were considered legally white, um, but their de facto whiteness was, uh, was always questioned. But there was some sense, even when we passed these, these quota laws, that Mexican immigration was actually a preferred source of labor. People were very well aware, as Alan opened his presentation with a quote that basically says something effective, you know, we wanted workers and we get upset when people show up. But, but the attractiveness of Mexican immigrants owed in part to the fact that we thought that workers would show up and people wouldn't stay, that they would go back. And because Mexico was right next door, well, it turned out Mexicans stayed. And so the fears about Mexicans have always been with us. And I would say that 
especially increased in the starting in the early 1970s when it was pretty clear that there was a, a new influx of Mexican immigration and perhaps at its height in the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. The question is, and I didn't talk about this so much in the context of my talk, the question is what happens now that we have a, a decade of no Mexican immigration? We are a net negative Mexican immigration and that's the first time that's happened since the 1930s. That's right. There are more Mexicans leaving the United States than there are coming. And mass, the era of mass Mexican migration, which has lasted about a century, appears to be over. And I ask, what is that going to mean in 25 years? What is that going to mean in 50 years? And can and I add, they have one of the highest rates of intermarriage. They do, so yes. So what is a Mexican? And this came up in the forum about the census, yeah. you know, about like how people self-identify and identifying as more, more than one race and what federal classifications are versus people's own named identities and the kinds of communities they live in, what, how they constitute their families. I think there's going to be a big change. I think that's a critical point, is we really don't know how this new pattern of intermarriage is going to affect how people identify. What language will they speak in the home? What will they pass on to the children? Uh, what will they do with their last names? Will they change their last names? Will they not change their last names? When the children go to school and go to college, who will they date? How will they identify? I mean, this is a new world. It really is that we haven't seen the like of. We got a little bit of a taste of it in the 1930s and 1940s when the groups that had come earlier began to intermarry with the population. And we got, uh, you know, A.B.'s Irish Rose and a, a whole genre of literature and music that dealt with that subject. Well, here it is again, and big time, and we don't know how the story is going to turn out. And it's a, a very important dimension of American history. The other thing I wanted to say is that we went through a period um, after the Second World War, there was a sharp influx of refugees. Many of my playmates as a child uh, had been born in displaced persons camps and their parents carried concentration camp numbers on their forearms. But after that period, there was a kind of downturn in American migration. And we don't really see a spike until we see the results of the 1965 Act. When Johnson signed that paper on Liberty Island, he said, this piece of legislation will probably change very little. And he couldn't have been wronger. And so by the early 1970s, when you have uh, many more Mexican workers, not just crossing the border to do seasonal labor, but wanting to stay, regardless of whether or not they were authorized or not authorized, and you have uh, Vietnamese who are coming as a result of America's departure from Vietnam, uh, and Hmong tribesmen, and uh, Laotians, and Cambodians, and so on. This is a very new ball game, and it's still playing out. We're still, in a sense, responding to that influx. I think the, the, there's a legalization part to, to what you're saying, Alan, that's really important. So when the, when the, one of the changes that the Immigration Act of 1965 does, amendments in 1976, is it imposes these, these caps on the number of Mexicans who could come, right? Before then, for about 20 years, the U.S. and Mexican governments are jointly in uh, uh, running the, uh, the Bracero program, a temporary, decades-long temporary guest worker program. Right, that, that, that guest worker program recruits, in, sometimes through private uh, uh, employers, sometimes through government agencies, but it's recruiting Mexicans to come work primarily in, in low-paid low uh, uh, jobs in, in, in the fields. That's, that's how my family starts to come. My grandfather comes uh, um, to the United States, um, and my, my oldest uncle has come to the United States. He hates it. He has a horrible experience. He's abused constantly. He, 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 once he stops doing that work, he goes back to his, his, his community. He vows never to return. He broke that vow, as far as I know, twice. Once for um, my sister's quinceanera, the Mexican girl's coming of age party, once for her wedding, right? Clearly, she was his favorite granddaughter. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, over, I'm over it, obviously. Uh, um, right, but that sets the that sets the pattern. For he he stays back in his town, but his sons come, his daughter comes, my mother, right? She meets my father. The rest is history, right? But 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 once that pattern develops, you remove the legalization, 
and people are Mexicans are still coming, only now they're coming without la la lawful authority to to be to come here. And then you have the consequences that we saw on that slide that Tomas Tomas put up. Right? Can I just say one more thing that underlined this point, which I think is really important uh, about the kind of fears about migration. And I don't know if it was brought up this morning. Forgive me, I wasn't I wasn't here on the morning panel. Um, but the the idea of the illegal immigrant had to be invented. Yeah. Oh, you did talk about. Yeah. It. Never mind. Then. Can you come? Oh, it's oh no! Worth I mean, underscoring because it's so important. Yeah, well, it's I a mean, very recent invention. Sometimes I talk to groups and they say, or I talk to individuals about them. They find out that I study immigration and they say, well, you know, why can't people come the right way? My ancestors came the right way. And the fact is that it, unless you had a communicable disease, which was the case with about 2% of the people who showed up at Ellis Island, it was impossible to come the wrong way. Everybody came the right way because there were no restrictions on European immigration. Right, and I, I'm glad that that came back because I do think that is an important reminder that the future has more possibility because we can see things that we think, oh, this is just part of our world, this phrase undocumented. Well, no, that yep. wasn't given. Did Moses bring that down? No. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a, a pretty recent creation and it could be subject to revision. The other part of this is who's going back. I mean, the other part of the Bracero story is that uh, we conducted deportations to try and, and get rid of the de Braceros who had stayed after the Second World War. Eisenhower conducts Operation Wetback in 1957. Uh, trying to, to basically purge the rest of the, of the Braceros that had still been here. Uh, other countries do this too. I got into, into a tangle with somebody who was a provincial official in Germany. Uh, I was giving a talk for the State Department and I said, uh, in, in relation to the, uh, the guest worker program, the Gastarbeiter program in Germany, I said, what do you want from these people? And he said to me, I was in a very bad mood that day, he said, I want them to come to work and to go home. Yeah. And I said to him, well, isn't that nice? After they've come and their children have entered German schools and learned German and are operating through the German system, now you want them to get the hell out of your country. Uh, and this is something to think about as we, we talk about immigration policy. Uh, there are implications for people, for families, and, and so on. These policies are not just involving one or two people, but several generations sometimes. Right, right. so uh, I have moved through a lot of the questions, but I think you all just went, uh, you somehow peered over my shoulder here and got, how is the changing demographic situation of those who are attempting to enter the US legally or illegally impacted the conversation? So I think you just all looked at that and followed that. Um, and then we did have a question about whether our preoccupation with Mexico and Central America, whether we may be doing a disservice to folks having hard times in Africa or, or people uh, who are needing to be somewhere else, uh, and are they getting lost in our preoccupation with the, so should, we, should we be attending more to people who have reasons to get out of the Middle East, to get out of Africa, and are we losing that as we think? Well, I'd love to hear what people say. One thing that brings to mind that's a kind of paradox, and maybe there's a small piece of optimism, this is a half full, half empty, is you know compassion fatigue, and people can empathize more with, with um, things that they can relate to or have a direct relationship. And the, re the reality is that the United States has a very direct relationship with Mexico. It has some indirect and sometimes direct relations with Africa, but I think that there's one reason that this is a country that has close to 60 million Latinx, uh, you know, descended people. This is this is no longer like a story of like immigrants who come to the U.S. This is a, a central part. I mean, as are African immigrants, but in smaller numbers. You see what I mean? There's a way in which that's the that's the story at home. That's part. That's you know. A third of our land mass used to belong to Mexico. It's, so I think that there's, that's one reason is that's, that's a home story. And it doesn't change the human rights questions of other places, but I think it actually underscores our special relationship with Latin America and the United States. Right. So uh, I think we're supposed to have a few spoken questions from the audience, so I'm just going to go faster. This one is a command to me, which is to <laughs> acknowledge Drs. Jimenez and Garcia as superior role models for young Hispanics. So well, I'm I shall sure just love that. There you go. I will just do that because why would I not? That's I love that comment. Let's just stop there. Let's just stop there.
talk, we'll talk more no. about that. Let's right. talk more about that. That's the only one that was a command. And then I will ask this question, and you'll respond briefly, and then we'll see if we have a couple of questions from the audience. Well, I've had all these questions from the audience. We'll have orally delivered questions. Should we, although I'm speaking them too when you think about it. Okay, so, all right, this is getting very confusing. I'm in a multimedia mode here and uh, spinning. So, should we, I think you'll say these, some, some really peppy things in response to this. Okay. Should we expect that our immigration policy will change dramatically for the better if our next president is a Democrat? Only if we flip the Senate. Not at all. Not at all? Did you, you said not at all? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think we'll go back to eight years of what we saw under President Obama. Yeah. We had the largest number of people locked up in immigration prisons in the history of the United States until President uh, Trump. Um, yeah. Does that matter? Uh, sure. I guess I, I, I was too quick to say not at all. Does it matter if you have 55,000 uh, 55, people locked up on a given day versus 35? Yeah, that matters. Is 35 the right number? No, it's not the right number. Right? Does it matter if, um, if you're, you're um, uh, talking about how Mexicans are rapists and, and, and beheaders? Yeah. Is it okay to do as President Obama did in November 2014 in a primetime speech and, and talk about how we need to uh, um, divide the world up into the felons and the families? No, it's not, right? So yeah, I, I, I mean, we're talking about, there's, there are some differences, I, I should be clear. There are some differences. Um, there are some important differences. And the man in the White House does matter. Right? And we're talking about a man. Or a woman. Well, right, but now we're, we're not talking, talking about, a about a man. No, we're talking about a man. Right? The man in the White House does matter, right? The old man. Um, the old man. <clears throat> but um, but I, think, I think that, you know, I spent eight years being critical of President Obama's policies. Um, immigration lawyers, I think, were running hard under President Obama and have been sprinting um, under President Trump. Um, so, yeah, I think things will change, but I don't see a return to some romantic era when things were wonderful for immigrant communities um, because that's not what was happening under President Obama. I totally agree. Uh, after all, President Obama was often referred to as the deportation president and with good reason. Uh, I'm assuming that the Democratic candidate is going to be Joe Biden. Maybe that's a, a huge assumption, but uh, it's the assumption I'm making at the moment. Uh, I don't see him varying from Obama's policies in a significant kind of way. Moreover, my, my reading of, of just being around Washington and people who are staffers and so on who I encounter, I don't think there's a real strong sense of will to undertake the problem at this point. Uh, I think there are other problems that now have taken priority over immigration in the minds of uh, many legislators and their legislative assistants and all the people who create the agenda of American political life. And I, ju I don't think that, though people are talking about immigration, I don't sense that it's a, a critical part of the political agenda moving forward in the most immediate sense. My immediate response is, oh my God, yes, things will be different. Uh, and and I, I stand by that with many qualifications. Um, so even under the you Obama... Only have really quick qualifications. Okay, even under the Obama administration, the first four years were quite different than the second term. Obama, you know, and look, it's a complicated legacy. Obama signed DACA when it was clear that the Senate and the House were not going to do anything on immigration. This president has done everything to rescind DACA, and it's likely to go away. Um, so I do think things will be quite different. Having said that, once a particular apparatus is in place, once a particular policy is in place, it's very hard to undo it. There is a sort of what social scientists call path dependency. Once you're on a path, it's hard to get off it, even with a change in administration. Having said that, uh, I, would, uh, I would take Obama's immigration policies back if I had to choose between the two over the current. Okay, uh, by my uh, cell phone here, we have five minutes and a couple of questions from the audience. I guess that, was, that should be the next step. So, and I don't know if we have our microphone. Uh, do we have our microphone folks? Right yes, we do. Yes, why not that you 
point him out. He is there, isn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. Very, thank you very much. Uh, question for the whole panel. Um, though it, several of you mentioned that the word assimilation has come up, and I'm, I missed one of the morning sessions, so if you covered it then, I apologize. But I just wondered if there's room in the discussion for something that I think is, is one of the major themes uh, of the history uh, of immigration and the history of, of ethnicity in the U.S. more uh, broadly, and that's the tragedy uh, of assimilation. I think that we speak of it as though it's a good thing. Patty Limerick did a wonderful move of saying, you know, we ought to broaden it, but uh, let me go a little further. Um, I think it's, it's a staple of uh, immigration courses of how, well, there are two sides of it. There's for immigrant communities themselves and other kinds of ethnically defined communities that part of their strength as communities, part of their source of, of hope and the ability to go on in the face of, of, of tragedy and difficulty is resistance to assimilation and, and retaining uh, what, they, what they came with. I agree with uh, Professor Jimenez about the language thing, absolutely. Um, you know, you're not doing anybody, any children any favors by not teaching them English. That aside, there's a whole lot of stuff that the, the people who, you know, take immigration courses, you, know, you read Abraham Kahan and Anzi Yazerska, Ola Rolvag, uh, Jerry Mangione, you know, there's just the, the, the sources are just full of, of how wrenching and, and what a great, tragic, permanent loss that may be. Um, and then the other side of people who truly welcome immigrants and truly welcome what a much deeper meaning of, of diversity than I think is, is current in, in most discussions today. Uh, another, Antonin Dvorak and uh, Horace Callan and Randolph Bourne and Jane Addams, I think the sim the, some of the um, settlement houses actually practice this, where you, you bring people and give them a means to preserve their culture, not just because it's good for them and their communities, but because what makes the United States uh, a truly free and the country uh, is is that it's you know rejecting a melting pot and having something more like a tossed salad or or lumpy stew. That's a strong okay. theme. I'm, I'm going to have to say if, uh, that we have added time. another panelist apparently. So, oh, and now I'm I'm afraid we don't have much time for a uh, just. I guess what I would say. Thank you for those comments, and that's very helpful to have that framework. But now we're down to do we each want to take a moment to say some quick summing up. I'm glad I was here because, or I wish I'd had more time to take up, or whatever it is that you want to do. So I, I think I will probably skip another question and just go with that. Okay. okay. Um, so can I address it very yeah, quickly? Sure. So I'll, I'll just say that um, I think one of the things that's true about assimilation is that uh, it means lots of things to lots of different people. Uh, as a social scientist, I tend to think of it as a, as a process by which groups become more similar. Uh, we, I like to think we tend to be agnostic about who becomes similar to whom. And then one of the other principles is that it is, as my friend and colleague Richard Alba says, something that happens when we're making other plans. Oh, when people nice. are pursuing their economic aspirations, they often wind up in situations, and since I actually just talked about this a second ago, where people are different from them, but it often leads to intermarriage, it leads to the diversification of social networks, the diversification of neighborhoods, and then there's a sort of intergenerational change in identity that takes place. So it's not always something that people are doing to try to shed the quote unquote old world ways, it's, it's something that, that happens, it's a byproduct of other kinds of processes. Um, and then I'll just answer the closing thing. I'm, I'm always glad that I come to something like this because I learned so much from the other panelists, and so I just want to thank my colleagues up here, uh, and I could have listened to you talk all day, um, and many of you did, so, so I'm, I'm just really, I'm really, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here and to, you know, and, and to, uh, you know, supposedly be a, an expert or a professor, but, but I'm actually just a student. Feelings mutual. I haven't heard Horace Callan's name in a long time. Yeah. Uh, but people should go back and read Horace Callan because he talks about uh, a kind of pale ethnic pluralism that I think is
basically the direction that we're going now. We, we should think about looking at American culture a little bit like uh, looking through a, mic a microscope in a high school uh, class and looking at amoeba and how the amoeba are constantly changing their shapes and their con configuration and so on. Uh, I think that Callan uh, envisioned a kind of uh, ethnic pluralism that's very much like the kind of thing we're getting. That is, we have memories of a cultural past. We still will celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, we are changing as a society. As Alba says, assimilation happens while we're doing other things. While we're planning the, uh, our own economic future, the future of our children, and so much else, we find ourselves adjusting to American society, conducting what I called before a cultural negotiation. And that, I think, ends us up in the position that Callan envisioned uh, when he wrote about this back in the 1920s. So we in the United States like to imagine ourselves as exceptional. It's the mythical city on a hill full of extraordinary people who are in all ways the envy of the world. And immigration law requires migrants to be the extraordinary people who we, who make those laws, imagine ourselves to be. But the reality is that the greatest moments in the history of this political experiment have been led by the social, by the misfits among us, by the anti-social delinquents who have dared to push the boundaries of what's imaginable, by the dreamers among us. And so I like to think of gatherings like this as moments in which we are willing to embrace the possibility, the need to dream of the impossible, to imagine what is not currently possible, because if we don't, we are never going to get there. Thank you all for being That's here so today. so beautiful. I don't want to say anything following it. That was beautiful. I, I, I never would have imagined this 20 years ago because I grew up in a very secular, mixed marriage home, um, uh, mixed faith home, but we haven't talked about religion. And I actually think, um, I was thinking about this with regard to the question about other countries, and I do want to say this. I like our model a whole lot more than France's. I think our model of freedom of religion rather than freedom from religion has gotten us a lot farther. I think that the outbursts of anti-Semitism in France are in some part because there's, they're trying to keep the lid on a simmering pot of diversity and diverse perspectives. And I do actually think that model, which of course has to do with some fundamental freedoms more generally in the Constitution, to bring it back full, full circle to some sponsors here who study the Constitution, is a better model for how we're going to figure this out than, it, than, the, than the assimilation model. And I guess I'll add one thing. As my husband and I, and my husband grew up in a fairly uh, observant Jewish home, we go to some friend's house in, in Washington, D.C., and we, we have a little mantra. Wasp is an ethnicity. <laughs> And we come to observe that everybody has their certain social mores and cultural practices, and not one of them, right, has the monopoly on virtue. Um, and so I guess if we could all remember that, uh, it would be wonderful. And I've, I, it's, of course, it's been a thrill and an honor to spend a whole day talking about such important issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yay. Uh, so I just I do want to say that since um, Tomas has joined us as a historian here, despite that moment of intimidation, that uh, and you're saying religion, I I would say what I've not ever said is that president of associations that doing history and thinking historically about this contemporary moment is kind of a theological thing because we are trying to lend our life force to the departed and to get their voices back into where we can hear them. And I don't think that's any denominational remark to make, but I have attended several billion presidential addresses and given them myself, and I've never really heard anyone say that, that we are here to lend our temporary time on the planet here to getting these voices back. And so, so all of you are historians and all of you have lived up to that theological opportunity in every way imaginable. So thank you so much, and thank you everybody. Thank you all for joining us, and that's...
Okay, just a very quick uh, couple of wrap-up notes. Uh, the, the River and the Wall, a wonderful documentary movie, uh, is being shown in the Sam Noble Museum at 5 p.m. I know that some of you have signed up to see that, but just a reminder of that. And uh, one last big round of applause for all of our wonderful guests today. Okay, free to go.